Okay, we're live on YouTube. We good to go? Did you check it? Somebody checking it? No, I changed our bridges in the uh okay. it just says council. Okay. Yeah, I changed it, but it didn't. Changed it now. Okay. Good. Good morning. I'm going to call this meeting to order at 9:03. Welcome, uh, committee. Welcome, staff. Welcome, public. Um, we have a long agenda today. We're going to get right at it. I'm going to uh, do a little housekeeping here. Um, uh, I'm going to confirm that the members present uh, and confirm quorum, uh, with the exception of Councillor Jaglowitz, who sends his regrets. Uh, I will confirm uh, there is only one member present, as I indicated. Uh, we'll confirm that the CAO, the clerk, and the members of the senior management team and staff are present with us here today. I uh, will advise that public input on the agenda was invited at the following email uh, address TML public comment at muskokalakes.ca that was none received. Um, this public notice must be read at each meeting. Today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded on the Township of Muskoka website and YouTube channel. By participating in the open public meeting today, you are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded and posted online. Item two, I uh, would it like to acknowledge that there is a supplementary agenda today. It was issued uh, yesterday afternoon and it is on the public record on the agenda uh, to add public comments from uh, Mr. Dirk Durstein, Seven Sisters Island Association, re item 4B, Bull Morris Road Parking. Uh, I would ask now if there are any committee members with uh, disclosures of pecuniary interest. Anyone regarding today? No, good seeing none, we'll move on. I will read that the motions today have been pre-populated with random movers and seconders to expedite this meeting. Uh, members shall physically raise their hand until the chair has confirmed that vote. If the vote is unclear, a verbal vote shall be recorded by the clerk. This is not considered a recorded vote. Okay. So I guess item 4A, we're gonna move right to that piece, which is uh, dele invited delegations, uh, which are five minute delegations on the Marina Road parking issue at Walker's Point in Ward A Township of Muskoka Lake. So uh, in this particular order, as it's indicated on your agenda, I'm going to first of all invite Lloyd Switzer, Mr. Switzer, to come forward and uh, address the committee, General Finance Committee. Thank you. Do we see him there? There is, there he is. I trust you can see me. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lloyd Switzer and I've owned a property in the township for the last 18 years. Sorry, sorry, Lloyd, we can, we can hear you, but we can't see you. So that, just so you know. Thank you for promoting me to be here. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, welcome. You have the floor, sir, for five minutes. Thank My you. My name is Lloyd Switzer, and I've owned a property in the township for the last 18 years and have paid significant property taxes for marginal and diminishing services. I appreciate the opportunity to engage the council on three topics this morning safety, transparency, and accountability with respect to Marina Road parking ban. An explicit act by this council to ban parking on Marina Road has now created a safety issue for my 20 year old daughter and guests arriving in the dark, relegated to navigating dark roads to distant parking. The safety issue applies to myself and all other island property taxpayers. Since the council created this issue, I would like to understand how the council proposes to address the safety issue that they have created. And what, will the council's and what will the council's response be when someone inevitably parks on far more winding 
and hilly roads where parking is allowed, such as Bar Lockin Road, and an accident occurs. I can appreciate that a traffic master plan is needed to develop, and there is a plan for a plan, but since the development and implementation of that plan will take years, what will this council do in the short term to address the issue by the, created by the council with this particular ban? With respect to accountability and transparency, this entire council has a code of conduct that explicit, explicit, specifically includes accountability and transparency. This council claimed transparency in acting the ban, yet I received no notification or any means to provide input. The township is able to reach me to provide me a tax bill twice a year, yet, I yet on a topic that directly affects the safety of my family and guests and access to my property, there's been no outreach. So I would like to know what specific actions were taken to gather input from island property owners who are most affected by this action. In the same spirit of transparency, I understand that the, the township has received numerous letters in support of the ban, yet I find no transparency in what their spe specific issues are other than the generic comment that it is a safety issue. The ban directly affects many island property owners and four property marine, marine, marine road property owners who claim to be unable to safely exit driveways during 12 weeks of the year because of road parking. Throughout the township, the region, the province, many people safely exit driveways with street parking many times every day. And in fact, all of us, including the Marina Road residents, exit parking lots and places of business and traverse cross streets in Port Carling and Gravenhurst and many other places in the township where there, where there are street parking with no complaints or safety issues. This council also has an obligation to be accountable for their actions and to their constituents. During the last meeting, specific councillors made statements about safety and an inability to traverse straight flat section of road immediately after hearing from both the fire chief and the traffic engineer that this is a standard three lane road with no safety issues with shoulder parking. To claim that vehicles cannot pass without mirrors touching or that trucks need to reverse when passing on a standard three lane road would imply that all three lane roads in the township are impossible to navigate. And that is clearly not the case. What is the action from this council to hold each other accountable for making anecdotal claims in direct conflict to the traffic engineer and the fire chief? And how has this council been accountable to a significant block of island property owners when there has been no engagement with those property owners. How did this council specifically consider the implications and perspectives of all constituents affected? And with respect to the traffic master plan, in what ways will all property owners be engaged in, pro in the process to provide input and have their needs reflected in the plan to ensure accountability and transparency in the process? You have an accountability to engage, listen, and represent all constituents in the township and not simply claim that the traffic master plan is a panacea that will solve all problems in the years to come and push the immediate problem down the road. In summary, a specific act by this council has created a safety issue and does not pass your own code of conduct for transparency and accountability in conducting township business. And I, like many, and I, like many other property owners, seek options and solutions to a problem created by this council. And yeah. thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Sorry? Yeah, if you wouldn't be so kind as to uh, forward your submission to uh, cmortimer at uh, muskokalakes.ca, please, for the, for the record. That'd Happy to do that. would be so. great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I'm going to call on our next uh, presenter, our next delegate, Lori Cashmore. There she is. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. You have the floor. Thank you, Glenn. Um, 
can you please, I, I really want whoever fixed your Zoom calls, um, they did a great job. And I really appreciate it if you could pass on the message that it, it's working for us. So thank you for that. Much appreciated. Good, thank you. And they heard that message. So. Thank you. Good morning. The cold, rainy, long weekend seems like a distant memory. Still, I hope you had a chance to enjoy it with friends and family. How many of you had several visitors? Did you have to worry about where they were gonna park? Probably not. And I'll bet all of you have free access on well-maintained roads, right to your private roads or driveways, paid for by my taxes. Yet you say it's not your responsibility to allow even free roadside parking for Islanders so we can conveniently, if remotely, access our properties? Walkers Point Islanders have only been able to have one or two visitors at one time all summer. The parking spots that we can beg from the marina because Americans and Europeans weren't back yet, but that's gonna end now. We've also heard that cars were supposedly parked on both sides of Marina Road, causing a potential safety issue. None of us have ever seen any cars parked on both sides of the road. The only answer we can think of is when the marina used to invite locals to free corn pancake and fireworks community events on long weekends. The local community came in droves. Solution, simple, no parking signs on one side of the road and don't invite locals to community events. Problem solved. Marina Road likely, likely started out as two ruts in the, in the mud. But as the needs of the community grew, so did the road. It's still rural, although well-maintained, but it now services one of the largest, most successful businesses in the township. Perhaps it's time to update that road at least the 700 meters to the marina to address the current needs of the community. The marina can offer guaranteed parking with their annual parking passes for regular customers, but the city should allow some street parking for those who are just visiting. Let's face it, millions, mostly visitors, park on streets all over the world. Why does this township seem to have such a xenophobic attitude towards visitors? Muskoka belongs to all of us, not just longtime residents. In 30 years, we've never had issues with any Muskokans. Last month, as my husband signaled to turn left into the parking lot, a white pickup truck sped by us, cutting us off with his finger in the air. I also understand that you received dozens of letters from constituents about parking on Marina Road. Yet only three, perhaps four properties could ever have been personally impacted with cars parking in front of their properties. Two of the closest car cottages are at least 200 yards from the road. You can't even see them, see the road from them. So I'd really like to know who is fueling this anger, vitriol and division among your constituents? And why would anyone want to promote this them versus us mentality when we should all just be sharing and enjoying the beauty of Muskoka? We heard at the last meeting from staff, the Marina Road is wide enough to accommodate two cars, even fire trucks with car parking on one side of the road. They had no reports of EMS or fire trucks blocked. But we also heard that there were two reported incidents. Interesting. Because one of our, because just before that meeting, one of our previous delegates emailed one of our counselors asking for a copy of any known incidents. Her reply email told him if there were to find them himself. So I'm formally asking for a copy of any incidents because we'd like to know if they were actually related to street parking or simply random accidents. Last month, some councillors requested a report from staff about Marina Road. To honour that request, I understand that the CAO's office has been proactively working on providing that report requested report due to the specific timely and unique Marina Road situation. Can we know when that report will be finished and available? Because we'd like a copy of it when it is. Finally, if this report finds no glaring issues or problems with Marina Road street parking, if there is no serious logistical reason for your decision to take away our right to easily access our properties. Will this council have the courage and political will 
to admit that you acted without all the necessary information to in make an informed decision and reverse this parking ban. Because if not, Islanders will want to know why you've abandoned us and Walkers Point Marina by eliminating our longstanding rights to fair access to our cottages. Thank you. I have submitted a, a copy to, uh, to uh, Cheryl. Good, thank you. With my question. Thank you for your comments and your questions and, and, and your update. Um, and uh, again, item, uh, item uh, 5A is an actual discussion uh, on this, this very issue. So uh, we'll take your words under advisement for the moment. We'll uh, thank you once again, and we'll invite uh, John Panichetti to, uh, to be our next delegate on this issue. Thank you, Laurie. You there, John? Where is he? Mr. Panicetti, are you, are you with us? He's gone from the screen. Okay, Mr. Panicetti, can you hear us? Can you see us? We can't. We're going to let you back in. Try that again. Oh. Mr. Panicetti, you seem to be muted. Perhaps you could unmute and uh, start your video. One of John, no? Okay, um, should we move on and we'll come back? Okay. Okay, Mr. Panicetti, we're having some difficulty connecting with you, sir. So uh, we're gonna move on to uh, Peter Shirk. If Peter Shirk is there, we'll come back to you, uh, Mr. Panicetti. We'll keep you in the waiting room. We can make that connection. Uh, Mr. Shirk, would you be available? Can you... Uh... The wonders of technology. There's Mr. Shirk. Oh, there we go. There is Mr. Shirk. You got me now? Good morning. Great. Okay. You go right ahead. Uh, Good morning. We have five minutes. Welcome. Great. Okay. Listen, uh, yeah, thank you so much for um, for letting me come back and, and I appreciate um, as Laurie said, the uh, the enhanced format because I got to watch everybody else. That was very nice too. Um, so, just a couple of comments. First of all, I want to you know sort of recap the last meeting as I understood it, and and uh, see if there's there's agreement on that. Um, you know, we had a, a good discussion. I thought last time on this issue, the um, the outcome of that to me was we had a majority agreement that, that in fact council had had acted probably in a in a rushed manner on on this issue and, and wanted to. Uh, look at it in more detail. And I appreciate that, that we had that majority. Uh, unfortunately, there was a procedural issue that uh, because the matter was brought up so quickly, there was a requirement for a two thirds majority. Um, somewhat ironically requiring um, 
advance notice to uh, to others who may have opposed it, which which I, I think is ironic because um, again, none of us that were adversely impacted from the from the first decision um, enjoyed that that advance notice. But be that as may, the, the um, you know I, again, I was gratified that, that we had a majority uh, in support. And, and I think we had that because of, of a couple of important testimonies. We had the, the fire chief indicate that, you know, there are indeed no, no safety issues. We had um, staff indicate the same thing. Uh, we had a discussion about potential insurance liability and we're sure that that wasn't an issue either. So, so really we, I thought advanced the ball pretty, um, pretty well on um, at the last meeting, but um, it, it would be nice to, to take it to the next level. And in fact, do uh, what we'd hoped, which was to have the council um, really suspend the parking until a better solution, uh, which will require some work. We understand that. And we're all, I think, willing to help with that work um, and, until that work is done and, and, a, and a better solution be deployed that, that sort of meets the, the needs and, and the requirements of others. Um, I, I did uh, have another uh, point to make that, that wasn't raised last time. Um, and I know one of the counselors, uh, I also learned at that meeting, I guess, was, was formerly a, a marina owner herself. Um, and I, I did want to point out that, that um, as residents, and there's been some discussion that, of you know, us and the marina working together here. Um, from my perspective, and I haven't discussed this with the marina, to be fair, but um, as I look at this, this is not a marina issue. This is a residence issue. I actually think from the marina's perspective, um, there is a, a clear demand for a resource, which is parking. Um, and that resource is supplied free of charge by, by the, the municipality. Um, removing that supply for that obvious demand um, is, is actually economically beneficial to the marina. So, so I think the marina actually benefits uh, from this, which I think is important to understand. Um, the, and, and, and perhaps will long term. I don't know what the ultimate solution is going to be, but but certainly, um, you know, the, the marina has a benefit. So so I do think that there's a bit of a issue here, too, where um, the economic interests of, of businesses may be adverse to to our as, as residents and voters economic interests. So I just wanted to raise that issue as well. And, and um, I, I think that point hadn't come up last time and, and, and perhaps. And again, I haven't spoken to the marina, but I, I don't think that they are as vociferous in their support for, for returning the free parking as, and I wouldn't be honestly, if I was a marina owner, because it's not in their economic interest. So that was one point I wanted to convey in addition to, to last time's testimony. And then finally, I, while we were talking about um, issue, issues, and I understand that the council responded to concerns raised by residents. It wasn't the council wanted to deny us free parking. It just happened to be that way and, and, and hadn't thought through. And this may sound a little silly, but uh, actually the more I think about it, it's, it's actually pretty um, legitimate request separate from this that I have. As Islanders, um, you know, we go through all these trials and tribulations to enjoy an added measure of privacy and, um, and remoteness. Um, one thing that I have encountered being an island resident, we like to hang out on our dock like other people do. Um, we like to enjoy our privacy. Uh, we also swim, um, you know, for particularly under COVID when there was lack of, of opportunity for recreation, we swim around the island. Um, the, uh, the risk of motorboat traffic. I have stood on my dock while a gentleman is in his fishing boat fishing 15 feet off my dock. Um, doesn't happen a lot, but it happens. Uh, not, not infrequently. Also, when I'm swimming around, I will get boat traffic whizzing by uh, jet skis, boats, uh, which, which is pretty, pretty uh, nerve wracking. I've not been hit, although certainly other, we've had tragic incidents on, on the lakes before. So my request of council, would you consider for the benefit of, of all island residents that we have a perhaps a 50 to 75 meter uh, zone around which, which boat traffic, uh, uninvited boat traffic is, is prohibited from, um, from accessing. Uh, I know that's an unusual request, but in the light of, of other council actions and the parking that has been taken on behalf of residents, I actually don't think it's that different. So would you consider this request? And if not, why not? Um, and, and perhaps we can discuss this further. That's that's all I've got to say. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, again, we'll take this in the aggregate um, as, we, uh, as we continue on in the delegation. So thank you for your comments, duly noted. And I would ask if you would please uh, forward those comments to uh, cmortimer at muskokalakes.ca. If you haven't already done so, Mr. Shirk, please, thank you. Um, I guess I would go back then to John Penichetti, who seems to uh, have shown up on the screen. Is he, do we have him now? We're gonna be admitting Mr. Penichetti. Are you on mute, sir? John, John, are you on mute? Could you uh, start the your your audio or your video? Is he gone? No, we don't have him. Okay, so in the interest of uh, moving this thing forward, I will, uh, again, we'll, we'll keep John in our hip pocket and if we can find a way to communicate with us, we certainly would welcome that. Um, I'm going to call on our last delegate for the Marina Road Parking 4A category and that is Kelty Barnes. If you're here, you have the floor welcome. Kelty, I don't... Hi, thank you. Thank hey, you, everybody. Good. Hey, good yeah, Welcome. figured it out. Yay. <laughs> thank you, Glenn. Um, unfortunately, the situation isn't one. I recognize it has been easy on anyone, islanders or mainlanders. And uh, I guess my husband and I, we've been living on Marina Road now for 14 years. And we definitely feel there needs to be um, support on both sides to find a better solution. And I was hoping that we had rectified this situation for the summer and we we're going to be waiting on the report to come out and see what the suggestions would be. Um, I guess being that we are on the mainland side and we are very near the marina, we are in favor of keeping the signs because we currently feel, and I know that a lot of our neighbors feel the same way is that it's much, much safer for everyone who's accessing the road, not just people driving on the road, um, people biking, walking, running, the camp students that are uh, walking with young counselors to get our uh, ice cream on the road. Being that it is the through road uh, on the point definitely makes it more of a, a sticky situation. I know that it uh, we heard last uh, month that it is safe for and is wide enough for emergency vehicles to pass by. But even the other day, um, two large trucks were passing on, without any vehicles parked on the side of the road, and it still remained very, very tight on the road. So at this point, we just find that the road is more accessible to people who are using it for exercise as well, because when you have um, um, people that are trying to walk and bike and um, be on the road, not just in a vehicle. If there's so many cars parked on the shoulder, then people are now in the middle of the road walking their dogs or walking with their children or with their stroller. Um, so I know that it's very unfortunate and it's become an issue that has created such a dilemma, but we were very, very pleased this year to see that um, the marina had put in the, the parking area um, on the corner of the road when you come onto Marina Road. But I guess um, there's issue that that is not large enough. I, I think we do need a better solution, but unfortunately I don't think removing those signs is going to help. The reason we asked for them and um, 
uh, spoke of this originally was because over the last few summers, there's just become more and more traffic and more and more people were parking on the side of the road. It wasn't just a few vehicles. People were parking for very, very long periods of time. And it was such a large stretch that we just didn't feel that it was safe. All the things that we've been discussing. So I'm just, I'm wondering, is there going to be a report? Um, can we find a better solution? But at this point, we really do, I think, speaking for one, one of, I guess the only people today speaking from Marina Road is that we, we do appreciate um, the safety that it's providing us right now with uh, walking and using our road. Being that it is a through road, it has different um, issues on it than other roads. So uh, my husband and I are very um, appreciative of the signs at the moment, but I guess we recognize that it's an issue for the Islanders and we're hoping for a better solution in the future. So thank you very much for your time and look forward to hearing how we can all uh, rectify together. Good, thank you. Thank you, Kelty. Good words and uh, refreshing to hear the other side as well because there are two sides to this negotiation if, it, if that's what it is. Um, so thank you for your time. I will uh, call on John uh, Panicetti if he's somehow available. Um, we're not sure that we have a connection. Uh, Cheryl, do we have? Yeah, so. We don't. Is it Mr. Penichetti, if you can hear us at all, is it possible you might phone in? There's instructions on the site to uh, call in. And you could do this uh, by iPhone, by phone, actually. So, I'm trying. We're, we're, yeah. we're doing what, what we can from here, and we can't seem to make that link to you. Oh, no, that's so. If you could, are you muted, John? Hello. Hello. Oh, there he is. There he is. Okay, hey, we got you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. We have we have okay. contact. Good stuff. I Thank apologize. you. Okay. Well, you have five minutes. We welcome your delegation uh, on the Marina Road parking issue, and uh, you're uh, you have the dance floor. Go ahead. Just just bear with me for ten seconds, please. Just want to get some peace and quiet. I needed some assistance from people that are a lot more tech savvy than I am. I apologize. <laughs> anyway, um, good morning, committee members and all staff attending. Um, just over 22 years ago, my wife and I, having holidayed in the Muskoka region for about a decade, purchased our lot and built our home on Stonewall Island, minutes from Walker's Point Marina. Since then, we have met and worked with in excess of 200, I'm sure, or more pe local people have helped build and maintain our dream home. Those people, those people live from Aurelia to Perry Sound. The majority of the residents are in the, in the local township. All of these people live, work, and play in the region. Their children attend local schools. They they commute on well-paved, well-maintained local roads, and their families have access to excellent recreational facilities. How are these services paid for? Tax dollars, as we all know. Uh, you as members, committee members, represent all taxpayers. I know this is getting a little redundant, but we like to... At, uh, sorry, I apologize. Sorry, at many, well, met, well both, both permanent and part-time members have, are, have access to the magnificence of Muskoka. We, like many who help build and now maintain our home, pay taxes to support all these services. I estimate 
that at Walker's Point, a minimum of 250 island property owners have access to the marina. On average, I also estimate there's about 8,000, annual taxes would be about $8,000 per property. That would mean that of the 250 islanders, there'd be about $2 million in taxes annually. Let's look at the municipal services for the 250 families. Roads to, to access the marina, local shops and supplies to maintain our homes and, and only recently an allocation of two and a half hours for Sunday garbage collection, which by the way, we gratefully are happy to finally receive. I assume that rarely, if ever, the local schools or recreational facilities are used by Islanders. So of the $2 million in taxes, we received basically garbage collection and, and road accesses. Now, be clear, I, like all of us, recognize that a disproportionate allocation of services and benefits is our choice. However, we expect one privilege for all of the, all of the taxes that we pay, and that is respect. We expect to be heard on the issue on issues like public parking on Marina Road, which has been a right for the last 23 years that I've been residing in Muskoka. Please respect our rights by properly deliberating this parking issue on Marina Road as you as you would objectively do so for any other issue brought to committee on a professional basis by directing staff to thoroughly assess this matter and report back to the committee. I thank you all for the time. And I believe and hope that cooler heads will prevail so that we can resolve this matter amicably and not have any, anybody getting overly worked up about this issue. I think, we, I think I'm sure that staff can, can go back and, and assess the this, this situation objectively. Thank you for your time. Good, thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, that wraps up the uh, Marina Road parking um, delegations, uh, all five of them. Um, and before we do get into a bit of a discussion about this, um, we would uh, acknowledge that Bo Morris uh, Road parking has uh, a few of their own issues. Those there are three delegates that... Uh, would like to delegate. So if it's okay with everyone, we'll in the aggregate, we'll, we'll uh, listen to those three people, different situation, different story, but um, it does speak to that larger uh, Islander parking issue. So uh, with everyone's indulgence, I would move to item 4B. And again, thank you, uh, Marina Road folks for your delegations. I would move to item 4B, specifically, uh, very specifically, Bull Morris Road parking. And we have three delegates, and the first is Liz Beatty. Liz, uh, welcome. You have the floor. Are you are you close? Are you here? Yeah. What did you do? Hi. Oh, sorry. There's four. Exactly. Hi. Good morning. I've, I've called in because the internet is no better in Calden than it is in the Stroke <laughs> Well, there's that about it. Go ahead, Liz. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Harding, Councillors. My name is Liz Beatty. I reach out today uh, about the urgent need to. Sorry, I'm just going to pause my uh, uh, mute my computer here. There we go. Um, I reach out today about the urgent need to pause the newly enforced two-hour parking on Morris Road and bag parking signs until a full collaborative re review of said parking. I ask that a motion on the matter be put forth and voted on today. I'm a fourth generation Islander on Fairhaven. Beatties have been pushing off from Bemorris Wharf every year since 1886. I speak to, as a sustainable uh, travel and culture journalist for National Geographic, cultural, uh, Canadian Geographic on Sirius XM and my award-winning podcast. I also lead a municipal strategy to manage overwhelming recreational growth in my home region of Calvin. So all this background is to say, I understand how complex your job is here. But I know too how other stunning parts of the world are getting it right. Spoiler alert, working with and prioritizing locals and threshold parking management are paramount. That's why I've chatted with several councils here on Bomoris. 
I so appreciate their commitment and generosity to the, of time. So what's confusing is Eve said, I don't just think we don't care about them. Nothing could be further from the truth. And you know what? I absolutely believe them. So why the disconnect? Here's my take from many generations. As a kid in Muskoka, boat slips, parking, not an issue. There's tons of space, very little municipal oversight. In recent decades, development pushes in, but as always, with sort of a nudge and a wink, there's this unspoken agreement between islanders and the township. You don't ask for a lot, we, we kind of leave you alone. Even a staff member divulged to me that uh, the number of parking tickets issued until now didn't justify the $1,000 app for online payment. So this unspoken understanding alone is why no one petitioned to remove the antiquated tour parking sign, a vestige of when the church was more of a going, going concern in Vermont. And I'd like to stipulate tour or parking in reality is no parking for Islander use. Anyway, FOMO Islanders have built lives and invested in island properties based on this 100 year parking precedent and this unspoken understanding. Now we find ourselves in this crush of 21st century growth, accelerated by a pandemic, by law enforcement expanded recently to tackle egregious development issues completely unrelated to Bomaris. New Bomaris enforcement is just collateral damage of a, of a planning process that hasn't really included us. Hence, well-intended, seemingly logical decisions that sometimes have harsh, upsetting impact on islanders like that. But not for Bomaris, without street parking, there is no longer sufficient threshold parking for rate-paying Bomaris islanders. And by the way, no room at other marinas. The community center as overflow isn't viable as the only non-private option. The safety issues for mobility challenges for those with uh, small children, impossible logistics for contract contractors, guests, and on. Most dramatic, decreased property values. My son painted a $2.3 million Tottenham Island golf, act, a golf cart access property to go on the market end of June. A deal was struck within a week or so. Then the parking issue happened. The deal was lost. That and another beautiful lot nearby remain unsold during the hottest real estate market in Muskoka history, all because of antiquated parking signs. And for what? Even our fire chief confirmed that the public, on the public record that the road with cars parked met their minimum requirement to pass through. Of course, let's strive to improve safety, parking management options, but there is no reasonable justification not to pause this enforcement while we settle, study possible upgrades. So that's the short term, but let's talk long term. Again, threshold parking. For Morris, isn't a tourist destination so much, it's an islander portal. That's what parking thresholds normally reflect, effectively removing street parking not only create a parking shortfall for islanders, it leaves only private options, which means subject to the vagaries of possible sale and change of use. For example, it's not unlikely the Yacht Club would want to buy Margot Murray's uh, parking lot if that were possible. And I understand why. Their mandate is to watch out for their membership. But I would expect your job on council is to watch out for all of us. We need to protect non-private parking access to Morris Wharf. Again, the axiom of threshold parking taking care of all locals. The Bemores combination of private and street parking effectively safely meets Islander access needs and has for a very, very long time. If we don't protect this non-private parking option, this municipal wharf may at some point, by default, just serve the Yacht Club. And what are we saying by passively allowing this? You need a club membership to pay uh, or pay a couple of million for a private landing. That's the price of admission to this lake. If that's the message you're saying to me, my little 120-year-old weirdo uh, occasional cottage and my 135 years of history, you have no place on this lake. I don't believe this council wants this. And I believe there's room for all of us in Muskoka. Today, we can take a step toward a new chapter of collaboration, breaking out of this negative cycle of communication. Show us that you're listening to Islanders, embracing common sense, acknowledge your point and how we ended up here. Support access for those of, who, those of us who carry the keys to Lake Heritage. Take this opportunity to study how this threshold parking at Morris works by allowing it to carry on under review. How can we make it better? I asked for a vote, a vote today on the specific situation at the Morris alone. And our Islander friends at Walker's Point realized this and are cheering us on, I think. But the bigger message is you want a new era of goodwill working with all Islanders. A vote to pause the Morris enforcement pending a full term review is that critical goodwill gesture. gesture. I thank you, Mayor Harding, councillors, for your time this morning and look forward to working with you in the weeks and months to come. Good. Thank you, Liz. Well said. Uh, I knew it would be. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, Carolyn Wills now to uh, to come on as our next uh, delegate. Carolyn from Fairhaven Island.
Okay. There we go. Hey, Hello. there you are. Welcome. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Um, again, thank you, uh, General and Finance Committee. I did delegate on July 14th and just chose to do so again, just to guarantee the parking on uh, issue on Bow Maris Road gets the consideration it deserves. I thank all the other delegates from Walker's Point and Marina Road and Liz uh, for their points, which I'm probably going to reiterate most of what they've said. Um, I just, again, I just want to make sure our voice and concerns and cause are heard today and moving forward as the next steps developed. As Council and the General Finance Committee are aware, parking for island and water access properties in the Bow Maris area is extremely limited. Limited, in fact, only to private parking, which currently is not available any, to anyone else looking to secure parking. Therefore, those requiring parking for personal use, uh, visitors, contractors, etc., have nowhere to park. Um, and as Liz mentioned, the no parking issue is becoming um, quite um, a situation in regards to resale of properties um, and limiting resale. Yes, there is par parking at the um, Milford Bay Community Center, as we know, two kilometers away. Um, but again, it limited, it's limited to people who have mobility issues, uh, young families, health limitations. And quite frankly, it's a winding road without sidewalks, without curbs, and without lighting. So it's, it's really quite unsafe to be something as a, um, to be used on a daily basis for that type of transportation. At the July 14th committee meeting, it was suggested postponing the Bomares Road parking issue until the transportation mas master plan in 2022. It should certainly be included in that as both, both scenarios on Marina Road and Bomares Road. Given the timeline and the urgency of this matter, that could potentially be one, two, three years away uh, for a resolution. In the interim, a solution needs to be addressed sooner than later, even immediately. Historical precedent would be to allow status quo as it has been for years. Suspend the parking enforcement relating to Bomaris Road parking, without issue, which we had without issue between the township and the islanders and water access properties to allow, this will allow all par parties to integrate with a network of infrastructure, which involves a complex list of stakeholders, agency, and the public to reach a sustainable solution as we move forward in this issue. So again, just to reiterate what's been said in the past, it is an issue and we need to find a solution sooner than later. Thank you. Good, Carolyn, thank you very much for your words and your presence and uh, you're right. I will, Carol. Yeah, okay, take care. Thank you, please do. Um, I'll call on Meredith Cartwright and then Dirk, uh, Dirk Durstein, uh, the last uh, delegator. Uh, but first of all, Meredith Cartwright. And Meredith, welcome. So Carolyn is still on the screen. Yeah, just I focus on the camera. Okay, Meredith. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. You have the floor in five minutes. Go ahead. Five minutes. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, council and staff, and particularly thank you my fellow island neighbors. I'm actually kind of in the middle of you all um, with um, Peter and Lori and Lloyd behind me and Liz and um, Carolyn in front of me. Um, I have a heart condition uh, and I am a woman property owner. And I would like to talk to you today about, well, it's an election year and as you know, as some of you, I am one of the people that shows up every so often to say that I think municipal councillors leading uh, a multi-billion dollar watershed, which supports the residential tax base of Gravenhurst and Bracebridge, um, that you all should be paid a lot more money to listen to us because you should be listening and 
you didn't at Walker's Point. Um, what was most frustrating to me about Walker's Point is the signs went up without consultation and Lloyd was exactly right. You do have our names and addresses when you come to collect the tax bill. Um, and the signs went up at the same time, the township put in a trail, which it is advertising on its website. And with the, you know, with the idea that you go to Clear Lake Brewing after uh, for a beer. And so on one hand, Islanders, uh, were like dramatically affected. And yet the township under the guise of economic development is asking day trippers to go in on rural roads. Um, when we know that already there's issues around parking and access for day trippers, we know that from Hardy Lake. Let me be clear. Muskoka is a luxury property market. And what Carolyn and, and Lori had to, uh, Liz had to say is true. One of the big issues, and Peter also talked about um, economic interests. We need you to align your interests with our well being and not pretend that when you make abrupt changes, such as a bylaw, it doesn't have an effect. That, however, can be distinguished from enforcing a long standing rule. Those are two different things. But in both cases, you're putting the thumb on the scale. And so you need, if you're going to do that, to be transparent and accountable with wide consultation. I mean, one of the economic interests we haven't thought about is what's the rise of land value over at Walker's Point right now with those low signs up? We need you to really think about us. Uh, when you pull on one part of the row over at Walker's Point, the but Morris is affected. And so the one thing that I would like to say, first of all, I don't think the signs, I think the parking enforcement of Morris, I think that there are safety issues. That's just my personal opinion. Um, there's, uh, and, and uh, my other personal opinion is but Morris should not be in the business of selling ice cream to day boaters because uh, there is already too much activity and um, there's a host of problems, traffic and, and safety issues. Um, what we do know about Bomoris is that the Bomoris Land Company has just purchased a new lot. Uh, we do know that Walker's Point plans to put in more parking. So my suggestion is, is that this council takes seriously the issue of making sure that Islanders have accessible parking and docking and use our tax dollars and your ability to plan and give approvals. And at the same time, you monitor closely what it is that you're asking for from the city of Toronto and the GTA. We're getting, the population is growing. Everybody needs recreational space. And that issue should be addressed at the province in terms of access to other lakes. And, and like keeping people, like uh, giving them access. But what's happening right now is we're asking day boaters to come through Gravenhurst. Grace Bridge residents are, are looking for um, day boating like access. And Lake Muskoka is, is like having a lot of problems. And it's gonna have more problems if this council does not start to stand up for its rate payers. And it is not too much to ask. Uh, Lori and Liz and Carolyn are all saying the same thing. There's nine weekends a year and some people have guests. So maybe we can plan for that. But at the very least, this council should start when it's making planning decisions to start thinking and start aligning our interests. Because Meredith, so sorry of all people to ask you to wrap this up if you could. Oh, please. Of course. Not Thank a problem. You. Um, yeah, I, I think I've said it. We're paying the taxes. We're not getting anything. And I, these frivolous ideas of bringing more day trippers in, and believe me, they go by my cottage. I am the local color. Um, 
is it's not fair as people are confronting real issues of access to their own properties. Okay, good, thank you. Well said, Meredith. And uh, again, duly noted, it, it, we, you made your comments available to uh, Cheryl Mortimer, C. Mortimer at MuskokaLakes.ca. That would be much appreciated for the record. Thank you. Our last presenter is Dirk Durstein. Um, uh, Dirk, if you are there, you are, sir. And uh, welcome. Um, and thank you again, Meredith. Uh, so Dirk, uh, we have you as a delegate. You go right ahead. There you are. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, councillors, for allowing me to speak on this matter. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Seven Sisters Island Association, an association that has been the voice of the Seven Sisters since the 50s. Others have spoken about the need for islanders to be able to have some parking area near their points of access. We endorse all of those perspectives, but I will not repeat them. We specifically agree with the first two speakers uh, who spoke before us uh, on this issue. What I wish to urge upon you is that Beaumaris is not Walker's Point. We endorse the perspective of the Islanders at Walker's Point, but the situation at Beaumaris is even more glaring. At Walker's Point, there was an allegation of parking on both sides of the street, and there is some local opposition to parking. At Beaumaris, there has never been parking on more than one side, and there is no local opposition. There is no allegation of any safety concern whatsoever. The road is more than wide enough to allow parking on one side and have cars drive by each other. It is obviously wide enough to allow any emergency vehicle to arrive. But in any event, there is now two hour parking during the day. So even the township is not concerned that allowing parking on the south side of, of Beaumaris Road causes a safety concern. Otherwise, it would be a no parking zone. In sum, there is no reason not to allow parking on the south side of Beaumaris Road. There is no local opposition. There are no safety concerns. And for all the reasons which have been put forward before, there is a pressing need for parking among the Islanders. So for all of those reasons, I suggest to you that the best thing for the um, council to do is to, as soon as possible, today would be great, uh, to rescind the idea of the two hour parking restriction on the south side of Morris Roads for all the reasons that we've put forward. And I speak again on behalf of the Seven Sisters Island Association and it's approximately 30 cottages. Okay, Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And I might, I might just comment if I just to point out more than anything, um, Meredith Cartwright, the previous presenter did in fact offer local opposition to parking on the road. So, I mean, that's what we're faced with. What a large issue this is. Um, I, would, I would suggest to you all, thank you. Uh, we will be discussing this uh, item. It's actually uh, item 5A, which we are not there yet. So just as everyone here that's a delegate understands, we hear the delegates from nine until however that unfolds. And then we move on with the agenda uh, item five and or six, where we have reports from our staff as well on certain issues. So I, I would suggest that we will be moving on. I see the mayor, I would like to offer a comment and I would welcome that. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wondering whether or not uh, it's appropriate as we uh, have the delegates still probably tuned into the meeting to actually advance that item agenda and have the conversation now about parking in general. Uh, I look to you though, as chairs, which way we want to go. Well, I did. Thank you, sir. I, I did discuss that with the CAO. And I, I think in the interest of uh, keeping this meeting moving as council is this afternoon, that um, we would take the following delegates and then move on because we don't know how long that discussion could go on. I do think we'll find a resolve when we're at the end of it. But um, I, I don't know. Um, I think we'll move on with the other delegates and uh, and then we'll meet, we'll meet back here uh, after probably a break and discuss item 5A, which will likely be around 1030. So that's what I would give the other delegates uh, that have already presented that kind of a window of opportunity. Uh, perhaps 1030, quarter to 11, we might be back after a short break. So anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to item um, 4C, which is uh, our delegates, are Hyman Ackerman and uh, Leo Longo uh, on license agreement application, Longview Investments Limited, rule number 9-14-073-01, item 
6A further down in your agenda. So gentlemen, I'm not sure who's here. I mean, Mr. Ha Mr. Ackerman, are you here or? Uh, yes, I am. Wait, there you are, sir. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all and uh, good morning, uh, your worship, Mayor Harding and uh, councilors and uh, Chair Zavitz, thank you. Uh, I am uh, basically just asking at this time on this subject matter for a deferral uh, on this file. Uh, just recently, we have entered into uh, an agreement uh, to acquire uh, the land just adjacent to the east of us on the water of Lake Muskoka. And uh, we are engaging with uh, planners uh, just now uh, who will be preparing a, uh, <clears throat> an analysis and a put forward access point for a, uh, for a land swap which would basically give greater access to the township and greater use of the lands than the adjoining westerly uh, road allowance. Thank you very much for this consideration. Good, thank you, sir. Um, is there any other commentary on that at all? Mr. Ackerman, uh, Mr. Longo, you're, you're here. Uh, thank, th thank you. Uh, Chairs out of it. I'm just here as a resource to uh, my client and the committee in uh, dealing with the referral request. I hope it will be favorably considered by committee. Thank, Thank you. you. And it, it, it essentially new information, interestingly new information on this uh, file. So again, uh, we will be discussing this under item 6A. So thank you, gentlemen. We'll try to get to that as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Uh, item 5D is a uh, referring to item 6B, which is a license agreement application McDonald roll number 2-24-72-40. Uh, John McDonald applicant or Nick Cronin uh, agent for the applicant. Are we, uh, do we know who's here? John, so welcome John, welcome Nick. I believe they're both. They're both. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, good. Welcome, you. go ahead. Well, um, I'm not sure, I guess, what I'm supposed to do here. I guess um, it's an unusual situation where uh, a license application has been approved by the council, and then I'm being called back, presumably, to respond to irresponsible, um, uh, unsubstantiated uh, uh, defamation by one of the councillors. Uh, you know, this idea... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're. That's not really why we're here. Um, respectfully, sir. And, and again, um, we actually can't quite get into that. Uh, I, I think you're back here. If you're confused, um, I'm concerned, and I wonder if uh, your agent could speak to that. Does your agent have any more sense I'm, of? Well, what what am I? I mean, there was some conflating of. Uh, a road that's being constructed on the other end of, of the lake. And it was suggested that I was building a subdivision. Um, I'm sorry, but you know, that's about as, as nasty a thing as you can say about someone in, in cottage country. And there's, I, I do, I, I'm not building a subdivision. I, I enjoy the nature of the property. I, I contracted with the most uh, experienced road um, constructor to build a laneway. Um, I had a fixed price for him to do it. He was, he was um, instructed to obey all bylaws and setbacks and everything else. And, and that's, what, that's what he's done. And this idea that I'm constructing a road within 200 feet of, of, of the lake um, improperly is just, is just absolute defamation. I've got a few hundred acres. Uh, this road will go around behind. Um, and there's no suggestion that the tree ordinance applies to that in any case. Um, I don't want to cut down any more trees than is necessary to build that laneway. But leaving all that aside, it has absolutely nothing to do um, with the bridge application, which accesses a completely, you know, it's probably a kilometer away. Um, so the idea that was put forward that they are accessing the same property, a laneway to one side of the lake and, and, and the bridge to Rosso, which was, was, was addressed to my, my, my holding on Rosso is, is just, absolutely incorrect and and it's it's I, I don't understand how how such a, such statements can be made it's irresponsible okay. 
Good. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for your, your words. Uh, and certainly that will, that will uh, uh, bear uh, out in item 6B when we discuss this uh, further with uh, the committee. So um, with your indulgence, sir, I'll ask you to, uh, to, to pause for, for the moment, unless Nick has any commentary or you'd like to say more. I mean, you're I, wanna, I would like to say one other thing actually. And, and uh, is that, you know, and, and I'm, I want to, the record, I want to be clear on the record on this. It was presented um, that the bridge situation was remedying an existing, very dangerous situation. Um, you know, there are children that, that come up and cross the existing dam, which I own, and, and they are at great risk. If you saw the dam, uh, and maybe I'll ask Nick to show it to you and if, if he's there, um, you will see what I, what, what I mean. And there was an urgency to this. So every day that issue is not addressed by the construction of a bridge um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the protection of uh, the, the uh, ability to, to have children not, or adults even, run across this dangerous um, uh, existing dam that's been there for 100 years. Every day that this exists poses a risk. And if something happens now, I, you know, I, and I, I, I'm going to be clear about this. If something happens now as a result of this delay, uh, I can guarantee that the township will be sued, not by me, but by, you know, but the more important thing is that, you know, a, a life could be lost. And, okay. you know, then it will be pointing fingers. Um, and, 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 you know, the township will be accountable for why this delay was occasioned and the individual members who made misrepresentations to occasion this delay will also be held accountable personally and, and potentially criminally. Okay, well, thank and you I don't want to, you know, I, I, I need to say that because if a children is, if a child is, is, is killed crossing this, this dam, this could happen any day. I don't want to have any, any questions in my own mind that I try to avert this, this, this tragedy. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, almost enough said. Do you, you want to show them? I mean, perhaps you guys don't know what we're thinking. Are you on side? See can anyone else see the dam? Yes, I can see the, the, uh, the crossover there. No question. Good. Thank you for that. Nick, appreciate that, that advice there. Um, okay. So, uh, Mr. McDonald, we'll um, ask you to, uh, to, stick, to stick around. There will be uh, uh, item 6B will be your file and you'll uh, be able to air that We'll, we'll air that out and we'll come to a resolve on it. So I assure you of that. We'll do everything in our power to take to, to care of this issue. I'm going to, uh, so thank you for that. I'm going to uh, call item 4E. I'm going to call on Amy Snow uh, to uh, present to us a food, and, a food rescue in Muskoka Lakes and expanding Feed It Forward Muskoka Reach program. So uh, welcome, Amy. You are our final presenter today. There you are. You have the floor and our attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to uh, deliver our, pro our projects that have been going on throughout Muskoka, um, near and dear to my heart. Um, I've been a resident of Muskoka for 16 years and cottage for 10 years previous with my parents and fell in love with the area. Uh, professionally uh, worked in dentistry. Uh, just recently became aware of how dire the poverty situation is. So I'm quite active with um, food security and sovereignty initiatives, housing, and as well as climate action because of the love of this region. Um, I have a presentation. I'm not sure if I can just share a screen. Would I be able to do that? Madam Clerk? Can we do that? Uh, yes, there you go. Go ahead, Amy. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm excellent. just going to, sorry, just hold perfect. We're gonna, we're gonna control so the I screen, just, Amy. Uh, so yeah. I know. yeah, perfect, thank you. I just realized that. Um, so I am involved with Food Rescue, which I'm just going to give you a quick um, update on this. I know that uh, some of you I have engaged with already on council to let them know what's going on around Muskoka. Um, but Food Rescue is the um, redirection of good food surplus from retail and industry farms to um, families 
rather than landfill. And as you know, our landfills are bulging. Uh, they end up in um, landfill completely packaging and all and creating quite um, a problem. Uh, next screen, please. So the poverty situation before the pandemic was already dire. And these were stats uh, throughout Simcoe and Muskoka. But um, I don't think I need to go over this. You have, you have the, the stats, but it's pretty dire, especially in such a lavish, uh, beautiful um, area. We are the crown jewel of Canada or the world as far as I can, I'm concerned. But there are so many that are suffering and more than ever because of the pandemic and uh, job loss. Um, next screen. So we know that being seasonal, um, a lot of jobs, people are relying on, um, on benefits and the stats show that they do not nearly cover the basic needs for housing and food alone, not to mention vehicle expense. And as we know, the logistics in Muskoka are crazy. Just to be able to get to a job, you have to be able to have a car and put gas in it. So we know more and more people that are struggling to even just eat. Um, next screen, please. So the mental health situation, because of the hunger, because of the economic stress, as well as the, um, the overall health impact, lack of nourishment, it's putting a lot of weight and load on our emergency crisis workers and our hospitals. Next screen, please. So through our food rescue programs, I'm really privileged to be able to work with organizations that have already been successfully feeding people that come to them mainly from town centers. So um, all of these places that you'll notice, all of these organizations, they are centrally located in Bracebridge, Gravenhurst, you know, they're in town centers. But we're realizing that there's so many on outer limits in rural areas that can't get to food. So the problem is much bigger than we ever realized. Next screen, please. When we look at the amount of food that is wasted in Canada, it's staggering and it's, it's pretty humbling. Um, so our mandate is to educate and engage both the public as well as industry to understand when food is actually garbage and that no organic waste should be going to landfill. So instead go to farms, compost, when food can actually still be utilized and to understand best before dates versus expiration dates. I won't get into all that. I'm, I'd love to engage more on that, but I'll, um, I'll continue on. So 60, almost 60% 60 of what's produced ends up in landfill. And the amount of loss financially is staggering, but it's the amount that's going into landfills that is most upsetting. And next, next screen, please. So for the landfill or the food rescue benefits, again, it's uh, relieving the landfills and toxic gas emissions. We stop attracting wildlife and watershed contamination. We're contributing to soil health when we're composting or feeding farm animals. Um, people are getting exposed to fresh produce when normally at food banks, for instance, we've had to rely more on non-perishables, but now that our food security groups are tapping in on the food rescue, they're able to access more fresh produce and get it directly to their guests and their clients. Um, it improves the well-being of the community. There's so much engagement, it's actually fun. <laughs> so we've made partners with uh, Feed It Forward out of Toronto, Jagger Gordon. Um, he not only comes to visit and brings this beautiful food surplus. Next screen, please. I'll show you all of the um, agencies coming together to collect. You can see what we receive. Also his meals, he professionally um, makes meals right now currently out of the Royal York um, and is shipping them or we have a volunteer actually from Gravenhurst Against Poverty that brings up um, thousands of meals that we keep here in Muskoka and then we distribute to other agencies. And next screen, please. Sorry, next screen. Thank you. So we have the meals. We, oh, it's fine. Um, we distribute them to the agencies, but again, 
we are noticing, especially with Gravenhurst Against Poverty's um, delivery service that started through COVID, that their dinners where people were coming for meals stayed at about 80. Um, whereas the Thursdays when they had volunteers delivering, it went up to 650 meals to be delivered. So we know that there are people that are not able to access food. Also, it's the stigma. We have people that have never been hungry before. And usually when people reach out for help, it's already in a crisis situation. Um, so we're, we have access to these meals. And what, what we envisioned was how do we access or even connect with those that are most vulnerable. And that is when I had a wonderful conversation with Fire Chief um, Morel and Fire Chief Rutan. And we talked about um, utilizing some fire halls that already have a kitchen to heat up meals and have a freezer to house some meals for families when they discover some that are in crisis. They are already present in the community. They're already respected. They're passionate about the community and helping. Um, and when they make that connection, not only do they give them the emergency need for food, but we can then connect them to collaborate with other community services within the area. So working together to even just find these families and ensure the best quality of life. Um, and at the same time, we're doing something so good for our, the environment and our landfill. Um, I just, I think it's an amazing partnership and I hope you feel the same. Next screen, please. This is just an example of how spread out the fire halls are across Muskoka. And that is our biggest issue is logistics. Next screen, please. I'll just get you to wrap up, Amy, if you could. That'd be great, thank you. Okay. Obviously, we don't want this to be an on, it's not an answer. It's a solution to a severe crisis right now. Our future plans are for food sovereignty. So we're, we're, there's other things in the make. We're not saying this is a long-term fix, but we see it as a great solution to what we're facing right now. Next screen, please. I just can't remember what, what else I had on there. In the future, if um, I may be invited, I would love to help support Muskoka Lakes in uh, further zero food waste initiatives. And I thank you so much for the adaptation and declaration of the climate emergency that is near and dear to my heart as well. And I'm hoping that we can collaborate further with the fire halls. And I'm just asking today, sorry, next screen, that you do approve some further discussion and see if this pilot project works and do what we can with what we have available already that the taxpayers are paying for and um, and really do the best that we can in keeping with the community benefit and our declaration of climate emergency action plan. Good. Thank you. For your Thank, time. you. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, I wonder if we can get the screen back so we can see everyone. Thank you. Um, again, uh, huge issue. Uh, I would ask uh, committee members for any thoughts or observations of Amy that you can answer here and now. So I'll go to the mayor and then uh, Councillor Bridgman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Zavitz. And uh, Amy, thank you for uh, your uh, dedication to Muskoka. Um, later this morning, the public will see a press release that's coming out from the District of Muskoka that will touch on many of these topics. Um, I, I commented about it at our last public works uh, meeting or, or district council meeting that the district is working on a new waste management strategy. Uh, a lot of that will include increased organics, but what you're talking about uh, should also be dovetailed into that for a new strategy. And maybe there's offloading again to help uh, locals. So um, I, I also will encourage you to reach out to director Stephanie Mack who's in charge of our solid waste uh, at the district as, you, uh, as we do formulate our new waste management strategy, but um, there will be some significant changes right across Muskoka uh, as to the way we deal with this. And um, I'd love to sort of suggest a little bit about what's going on, but I know I approved the release last night and it will be out sometime this morning. I don't want to get ahead of myself in case there's some technical issues, but uh, look for a press release later on this afternoon. How about that? Thank you. Good. Thank you for that insight. Uh, puts us right at the front of it all. Uh, 
Councillor Bridgman and then uh, Councillor Hayes. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Zavitz and Amy, nice to see you again. I have had a chance to chat with Amy before. So I think this sounds amazing. I would love to have Chief um, Murrell just um, chime in for a minute. I, if we can do this pilot project, I think it would be great. And as you've had some discussions with him, do you think we could get him just to say a few words? Chief Morell, I might, I might say that uh, pre-Chief Morell, it would have been my thought as well that uh, perhaps to interface with our CAO. I do believe that from what, I'm, what I understand of this, that it, it does cross over to a few different departments, not just fire, but certainly it's focused on, on that fire piece. So maybe more as a corporation, how, how would we handle this on a larger scale? So, uh, but certainly uh, Chief Morell, go right ahead, sir, you have the floor. Uh, good morning uh, through you, Chair. Uh, we, uh, I have talked to Amy about this. I asked her to make this request formally of council. Uh, the conversation that I had with Amy uh, was more about the logistics of using our buildings and would we be in favor of that. And uh, a lot of the things that she has mentioned are you know, near and dear to our firefighters. We have, uh, for a long time, we have supported the food drives in the area. So in order to ensure that there was um, you know, a, a unified approach, let's call it, to the way that we deal with this issue. I asked her to make the presentation to council so that they had a full understanding of what we would be asked to do. And uh, that's why she's before you today. We would support in the majority of what she's asking for today, which I believe is freezers in some key fire departments and some key personnel that would be involved in accessing the food on their behalf. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hayes. Thank you, and through the chair to you, Amy. This is a fantastic opportunity. Um, I would just say that a lot of our fire halls are attached to our community centers. Uh, you'll find a wealth of volunteers there and a lot of information of what goes on in the community. And if this goes forward, I would suggest that you uh, reach out to them because I know as a uh, hall board member that they would be very receptive. Um, several have stepped forward in COVID to help out in different ways. And um, really it surprises me with the amount of volunteers that we have here in Muskoka that are willing to go to that extra step and just making sure that somebody has a good um, food on their table is, it's, it's a basic. And um, I'm hoping that this will perhaps spur the township to um, get a food, food charter um, going as soon as possible. Okay, thank you, Amy. Good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and that chairs I um, And that, uh, thank you, Amy, for the excellent presentation. And um, I'm sure that you know, and that talking about it, maybe what we could do with some of the other halls is what Milford Bay uh, has uh, done. And that they, they've put uh, gardens in, community gardens in. And I'm sure there's some spaces that we could uh, free up on on some of them if you if you talk to them about it. Um, and that, so it, it, uh, it is working. And, you know, every once in a while, I get a fireman knocking on the door asking for food because they uh, do uh, collect for the food banks and that. And, uh, the firemen do great work and uh, all, all the firefighters should be commended as well. But thank you for all your hard work. Good, thank you, thank you. Well, Councillor okay. Roberts, go ahead, sir. I'll be very quick, um, Madam Chair. Um, the com the com Melbourne Bay community do have free gardens for the community. And um, my uh, fellow community leaders um, secretly or get the food out to the families within the Milford Bay. but. Uh, what um, our delegate uh, uh, is asking is for a pilot project. And so uh, she needs to maybe talk to um, someone in the township to see how the, what the pilot project would look like and how they would get it off the ground because we couldn't approve anything today, I don't think. Thank you. That's right. Thank, thank you. And, and to, to wrap that up, I think what, uh, which is going to be a surprise to our CAO, but I might just ask him uh, uh, to say a few words. Just to summarize, I think it's exciting what the mayor has just said. Uh, and then here we come with this. Uh, we, you know, this could be a, a breakthrough piece. And um, I'm excited by it, but I also am. Uh, 
I won't use the word concern, but I'm, I'm, I'm realistic about the fact that, as I said earlier, I do believe there's a number of uh, areas that the township as, as the corporation needs to consider. Uh, so I would ask uh, our CAO for a couple of comments. My thought might be that we would uh, ask for a staff report uh, to come through, perhaps right to council next month, instead of coming back here. I'm not sure what the appetite for that is. Uh, with you all as committee members, but um, that would certainly get it on the dance floor and get it up to where we can deal with it next month and then move on either way. So I would ask uh, CAO, Derek, to uh, comment on that. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, members of the committee and, uh, and to the delegate. Uh, exciting initiative. I think uh, Chief Morrell uh, is indicating that from a support perspective, uh, his team may be able to assist in the initiative. The one thing that strikes me is that uh, there should be a link to uh, District of Muskoka Community Services with respect to understanding how this, this initiative could um, dovetail into some of their programming that may already exist or, or, or could exist. And so um, I think that type of investigation should occur. Uh, once we have a better sense of that, then we can come back and uh, sort of have Chief Morrell indicate through a report how, uh, how, his, how his team fits into that overall piece, if you will. Thank you. Okay, I did see the Council in Ishikawa was gonna comment, but then of course the CAO touched on what she was gonna say. So that's excellent, working together. Amy, you have a comment. Go ahead. Thank you so much for your comments and support. And yes, I have had extensive conversations with Stephanie Mack and uh, I applaud the extended green bin program. She had talked to me about that and some of the other initiatives. Um, the, the community gardens are expansive. Uh, we had rescue plants that we couldn't find room for and we created our own home garden and we are giving that away. Uh, Bracebridge Out of the Cold has made their, our kale put it to good use. I did want to touch on something that's very important. I have been granted $10,000 from the District of Muskoka to continue these food rescue initiatives. So I'm in the process of, of uh, incorporating as a nonprofit but also just trying to do a flow through with another nonprofit in our area. And I work with so many of them. And um, I just, unfortunately, because they've already received the grant or they are, I need to be my own standalone. So there's a little bit of paperwork going on, but I definitely, we have the support of the district and we so appreciate the support of the Muskoka Lakes Council. Thank you so much. Good, thank you. Amir, go ahead. Uh, thanks. And uh, I was probably about two minutes premature in my conversation last time because the district has just issued the press release, <laughs> which uh, and the starting point just for council, and I'll bring it up again this afternoon or later on in our uh, district updates. Um, but we are terminating our contract with uh, Waste Connections Canada. Uh, we will be sourcing a new contract in the coming months. And uh, a year from now, it's anticipated that we will undergo a new contract with an entirely new waste management strategy to extend the life of our landfills uh, and continue to do a better job for the environment in and around uh, solid waste organics. So uh, that press release just came out and you will see more and more of that coming, literally. Thank you. Good, thank you. All good news here. Uh, I, again, so I'm gonna go back to the notion. I'm gonna look to committee. Um, would is there an appetite for a staff report uh, coming forward uh, for next month uh, on the issue? Um, directionally, I'm not quite sure uh, where it would go. I'm seeing a lot of no. Uh, okay, the Mayor, go ahead. Uh, just a question. I, I'm certainly interested in this program. Um, I think that we need to circle back with our CIO, with our fire chief, um, and fully get a, a better staff report and timing. It, it's nice for us, again, as council, uh, to say, bring this to us next month. We do know that all of our staff are running uh, 10 times normal speed right now, and uh, just don't want to set any unrealistic expectations. And I also would like the district as such to be involved to make sure that we do circle back with that. Um, so uh, Chair Zavitz, maybe uh, our CIO could comment when's a reasonable expectation uh, to understand a further implementation of this or, or staff report. Good, let's ask him, thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, further to the mayor's question, it, it's uh, not clear to me in terms of Ms. Snow's timing. Uh, I'm not really aware of the discussions, uh, details of the discussions that she's had with Chief Morell and, and what they were looking uh, looking at. So perhaps uh, either Chief Morell or uh, Ms. Snow could, uh, could help us there. Okay, Chief Morell, I guess this might speak to your comfort zone here um, with this uh, let this piece go ahead if you have uh, further comment based on the CEO's words. Well, I was hoping uh, I was hoping for a little bit more uh, detail in the request as well. So, uh, from what I understand from my conversations with Ms. Snow in the past, uh, was that they needed a place to plug in freezers, and they needed us to help manage the food that would go in and out of that freezer in an emergency situation, which uh, is akin to what we already do in the fire service, it's a well attended building. It's very secure. It can be accessed for this kind of community outreach. Um, I believe that was part of it. The other part of it that Ms. Snow didn't mention, but uh, it is a problem for us in Muskoka in particular, and it dovetails nicely, is that at night, if you can imagine at two in the morning when we fight a fire, we often have to feed our firefighters um, uh, as, they, as they hit that four hour working mark. Uh, it's often difficult, especially during COVID, to find places where we can get that food. Um, Ms. Snow had mentioned that maybe this was a, a possible solve for that problem for our own membership as well, um, because the, the food will eventually expire, I believe. But I'll, uh, I'll leave it to Ms. Snow to explain what else that she might require us to do. Amy, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I wanted to really have more conversation and I didn't want to take up any more of anyone's but especially Chief Morrell's valuable time but to know of the best locations because I I realize that you're widespread there's a number of fire halls we may not be able to furnish every one of them with food so we want to know which ones have the residential greatest need um, it was also an opportunity for education that if we did take the program to a level where firefighters actually had uh, food rescue in, in one of the off um, inventory trucks, for instance, that we were able to convert into a refrigerated unit, which we can do easily, um, that that would be an opportunity to not only share with the public, but also educate as far as fire safety and um, so there were some different branches that I wanted to work on. So I really just wanted to have um, approval to explore what we could do together as a collaboration. And definitely having that food available for anyone in need, that is especially true for our volunteer firefighters, our firefighters, they're, they're out there, they need to be nourished in order to continue to help the public. So yes, anyone in need. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, so to keep this thing moving, keep you moving forward, um, I, I would challenge you then or, or invite you to uh, continue your discussions with the, the Chief Morrell. And then I, I believe what we'll do in um, September is again, keep this on the front burner, uh, get it to come back, uh, whether it's a report uh, generated from September, right to council, et cetera, or whatever. I think you can see that there's a genuine interest, there's a genuine concern, there's a genuine interest in working with you with this cause. And so I would invite you to continue your dialogue and sharing of information with uh, Chief Morell while some of this waste management stuff uh, kind of dovetails in and uh, comes to fruition. We may have even more information later as a result of other things that the mayor will share with us. So um, if that works for you, it certainly would work for us. So I, I would thank you for coming forward and uh, you know you have our full attention and, and I continue to reinforce that uh, what I'm seeing around the table here is that this is a topic that we would like to embrace on a longer term basis. So thank you for your time. Thanks for coming forward and have a great day. Take thank care. you all for thank your you. service as well. Thank you. Okay, please. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to an end uh, of this morning's uh, first part uh, to get us to 5A, which is a discussion on parking. So if we want to take a uh, five minute break, please, and we'll see everyone back here at uh, 1045. Thank you.
Okay, good. I just heard the words pitter patter, so that's what we're going to do. <laughs> Chair Zavix. Yes, Councilor Nishikawa, go ahead. I, I, I'm just doing a test to see if you could hear me. I'm still having some. We can hear you. Thank you. We can hear you and see you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, um, who are we awaiting? Councilor Mazan? Mayor's here, Peter Kelly, Peter Kelly, okay. Why is everyone frozen? Guys? Peter's frozen. Alan's frozen. Oh, no, you know, my air condition is working pretty good, but uh, I'm not really frozen, <laughs> just cool. <laughs> you are one cool dude, I can give you that. I love it. <laughs> okay, everyone. Um, we do seem slightly lethargic on internet, but we're going to give this a try. Hopefully everyone can see, uh, hear us, uh, waving, nodding of head, something just to, okay, good, good. Okay, so we're recording. Uh, welcome back to uh, uh, the committee. Welcome back to staff. Welcome back to our public. And uh, we're going to move on now with our agenda, general finance this morning, August 11th at uh, 10 to 11 with uh, discussion 5A uh, regarding Township Island parking. And uh, I would ask uh, committee members to uh, raise their hands and provide comment to the delegates uh, that we've heard this morning and represented. Uh, Councillor Roberts, go right ahead. Thank you, um, Chair, and through you, um, I was the one who put this on the agenda item. And when I put it in, it was not for the intent to respond to the delegates, which I think we will uh, subsequent to what, I, um, what I'm asking for on this uh, communique. Um, so I'll, um, with your, uh, your uh, permission, I'm gonna continue on, on why I put this on the, onto the agenda. So basically I'm gonna say that um, all are aware that the mainland vehicle parking and boat dockage for island property owners has been a challenge for decades. And for the past few uh, for the past few weeks, um, I know the councillors from Ward B has spent numerous hours uh, attempting to fully understand the situation, the challenges, and the causes, and we're looking into potential solutions for the island, vehicle, uh, island parking as it pertains to the the Bemoris Mills Road, Church Dock Road, etc. And each one is is a, has to be a, we have determined will have to be a unique uh, solution. So here's the key point. In my, effort, in, in my efforts of uh, understanding, I was informed by a township representative that the township of Spoka Lakes do not have a position on island parking. And therefore, by default, for decades, island property owners have been responsible to secure adequate mainland vehicle parking and boat storage, boat dockage. We are, we are all aware that there are no inexpensive or quick solutions for island parking. We may also agree that allowing for limited and safe vehicle parking on townships roads is not a long-term solution or a viable solution for all island property owners and areas. I do not agree that the township has the responsibility to lead or be the spokes group in solving the island parking problem. But I, I definitely uh, agree that uh, as, a key, as a key stakeholder, they should be at the table to come up with some, a solution. And at that table should be the MLA, the Friends of Muskoka, our Muskoka, marinas, islander leaders, mainland waterfront leaders, so we can get a, 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 a group there that'll come up with a possible solution. Um, but there are actions that the council can do and are doing right now through other initiatives to help try to alleviate or find solutions for island parking. And those, that is being done through the new official plan and, and, and the proposed or the uh, 2022 transportation plan. So in closing, what I think we have two things. I think the township needs to go on record that this is our position. 
and that we're going to work with constituents to change that position, to define that position, and work with them to solve this this this, this huge uh, problem. Also, everyone must be aware that that nothing will be done without a cost, and everyone should be aware, or or will be aware by now, that for every for this year's budget, for every hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars of increased budget or any topic, even this topic, will cause an increase of 1% in the, in the tax levy. So, so my, 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 uh, my ask for under this is that, that the township um, uh, communicate their position on island parking and, uh, and identify what they will be doing to move forward to help solve this for all parties concerned. Thank you. Good, thank you. Well, believe it or not, I think you just did. Um, you provided a, a really excellent sort of uh, platform, if you will, for what the status of what this situation truly, truly is at this point in time. So um, we'll get back to that. I'm going to let the mayor speak and then uh, Councillor Hayes and Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The um... Mr. Shirk had commented, I'm not sure if he's still listening, he asked for, uh, I'll just circle back to that delegation, uh, asked for potentially a boat free zone in front of people's properties. And Mr. Shirk, unfortunately, um, it's the federal government that regulates waterways, and uh, we do not have any jurisdiction uh, from the shoreline out, unfortunately, to be able to say you can't have uh, someone fishing five feet off your dock or 10 feet off your dock, and they come by mine as well. So I understand, and I'm not a fisherman, but uh, I understand uh, the issues there. I, I think the reality is, um, is it our job to fix this problem uh, or to provide Islander parking? Um, I don't think it is, but I do know that by the actions of our council a year ago, we have created a problem. Um, I'm not sure if this is gonna work. I'm gonna try this just for fun here while I'm chatting with you because I saw this analogy the other day and uh, is it going to work? Might not here. There we go. See if that works. If I move myself, uh, you can't right, quite see it, but every action has a consequence. And we need to just be very careful that when we provide one action, we oftentimes have significant consequences. And by what we felt was solving a uh, safety issue, on some of these roads, we have created additional problems. So what I would really love, and I'm not sure when it happens, um, but I think we really do need our staff's input. I think we need to understand the severity of the problem. We need to understand where this problem exists across uh, the township. Um, I think we need to chime in a little bit on some safety issues. Uh, we have some very qualified staff and, and every department on a planning application, we hear from our public works, we hear from our fire chief, we hear from the school boards, we hear from all of those kinds of uh, development issues. And we need to do the same in this particular case. We may wanna have a position, we may not wanna have a position going forward, I'm not exactly sure. But the one thing I do know is that um, where last month we tried to potentially alleviate a problem by removing uh, some no parking signs or putting a bag over them, uh, that failed. So the problem of this summer has really come and gone. And we probably have about an eight month uh, window now to try and rectify this before all of our seasonal residents come back. Um, nothing's gonna happen in the next 30 days or 60 days. So I think we have a little bit of a pause for time, but I would like to make a specific request from a staff perspective as to timing when we can uh, do a little bit deeper dive into how big this problem is across the township and uh, what other options might there be available to address it because clearly there is an issue with uh, Islander parking and uh, we are all one and as uh, one of the other delegates said we are a council that has to represent all people so uh, we have Islander residents uh, that need to um, have their voices heard and uh, help them as best we can. So I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, to you, both yourself and Councillor Roberts, uh, I, I do believe that uh, from this meeting today will be some sort of a request to staff to uh, embrace at minimum uh, Walker's Point and 
Paul Morris um, on a staff report and um, and then leading into that further issue, uh, the issues as summarized by Councillor Roberts. So I'm gonna let um, Councillor Hayes go first and then Councillor Kelly and then Councillor uh, Mazan, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, through you. I'm gonna disagree with Phil. I don't think we created a problem. I thought that, I, I really think that we brought a problem to light. Um, and it's not just a Walker's Point issue. It is an issue that is all over the township. So I think that any solution that we look at, we should look at um, township wide because it, it is a puzzle. And what we do in one area does affect another area. And um, we have Islanders out there that are saying, you've taken away our free parking. But we have other Islanders out there that have gone to the expense of buying landings and marinas that have purchased land for parking. So it, it has to be a balancing act, what we do. And with our OP coming forward, it, it does state very strongly in there that you must supply private parking for Islanders. And this means not only the owners, but it means their visitors as well. I was talking to one, um, one rate payer who said to me, I, I don't know what their problem is. I go to visit my friends in Georgian Bay, I pull up to the marina, I pay my daily fee and we get on the boat and we have a good time at their island. So it is something that is, is the norm in most cases. So I know it's been kind of a shock um, because there are so many, like one gentleman said he needed nine spaces. That's, that's a lot. And um, just please remember, we are just coming out of COVID times. It looks as if the fourth wave is going to hit. So um, I think that we do have to look at this on a whole, not just in Vermores, not just in Walker's Point, and we have to get it right. Okay, good. Thank you. Councilor Kelly. Uh, thank you. And through you, uh, Chair, uh, I, I, I don't want to worry too much about how we got in this mess. We're in a real mess here. Um, and, and I think uh, we need to be fairly pragmatic in, in finding a, a, a short-term immediate solution and then perhaps over you know, the fullness of time over the next few months come up with something more permanent. Um, we made a decision a year ago uh, to enforce no parking rules uh, based on safety. And yet I'm, I'm struggling to find anybody uh, in a position of uh, competency, I guess, or authority when it comes to safety matters, tell us that there's a safety problem. I haven't heard that yet. Uh, there's a lot of people who object to cars parked in front of their house. I understand that. Um, there needs to be uh, uh, some fix prescribed, but short term, I think we need to resort, resort to or uh, revert back to where we were a year ago. Uh, let the parking continue. We need to be the leaders. I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree 99% with what uh, Councillor Roberts said. We need to dig in and find a solution to this over the short term. But I don't want to sit back and let other people carry the ball. We need to step up and make this work. Uh, these are our constituents. These cars aren't going to disappear. They don't, you can't will them away. Um, to the extent that there was a change in the enforcement policy, I don't think we did a very good job communicating it. I think there had been a longstanding, uh, uh, um, basically, a contract, if you will, uh, unwritten, perhaps, uh, that we, we changed uh, in the off season or in nearly the off season. And I think we need to just, in the fullness of time, just go back to think, the way things were, let people park and bring, bring them together and lead them to a solution. I'm actually heartened to hear that there may be opportunities, private opportunities at uh, Walker's Point Marine. This thing may solve itself with, through free enterprise, through the availability of space. We need to lead on that to the extent that we need to help or facilitate uh, the development of uh, some kind of additional parking. You know, uh, I, I'm not saying we need to buy it, but we certainly need to make sure we're not an, uh, an you know, somehow obstructing it. Um, but uh, I guess we need. I guess we need to find a way to to come to a conclusion on a long-term problem, but it needs to get fixed. And short term, it needs to be alleviated until we can find the right long term uh, solution. Okay. That's Thank it. you. Thank you. Councillor Mazan and Councillor uh, uh, Bridgman, sorry. Uh, thank you, and through you. Um, 
I, two points. First of all, I do want to hear from our CAO. Uh, we've spent hours over the last month um, since this has really come to a light talking about a path forward. Um, and I think it's important. We acknowledge, yes, we have a problem. And here are, are the different ways we're going to be um, advancing things. So first of all, I'd like to hear from our CAO, if I could. Well, Mr. CAO, Derek, would you like to comment on? Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, my apologies. Uh, I had uh, some technological issues that delayed my response. So uh, based on the conversation that I've heard over the last uh, couple of months, as well as even as, as recent as this morning, um, and I've heard it from members of council, I think that uh, you know the mainlanders and islanders are an important part of this community. And so decision-making needs to, uh, I think the mayor alluded to it, we need to look at the entire community and, and represent those interests. And so it strikes me that with respect to this issue, we've had two events over the course of our term that have Im impacted or exacerbated the issue. The first was the flood. So the notion of, you know, a, a plethora of contractors having to access uh, the lakes through a variety of locations, uh, along with the, the pandemic. So an influx of recreational users and quite, fl quite frankly, residents wanting to um, seek, uh, uh, seek a beautiful uh, setting to escape that the, the the drudgery related to public health measures and and the pandemic per se so you know we've also heard this morning arguably that um, on street parking is is not the solution in all situations um, so looking forward it strikes it strikes us and we've talked about it the we do have processes in place or, or strategies which envision solutions going forward for, um, for this issue. So we, we have thought about it. So we have an official plan right now, um, uh, which contemplates the need for a mainland parking spot for new island development. I think the official plan policies need to be um, subject to tests, need to enable the creation of individual access points along with waterfront landings and be somewhat more lenient to enable marinas to provide parking related facilities. And so that those types of permissive policies would contain tests that would enable an evaluation of site-specific circumstances. So that that enables council to balance the public interest as it relates to all concerns. I think another piece going forward is, um, as it relates to the recreational use of the, uh, in particular, our facilities, we have talked about in the strategic plan, the need for a master transportation plan, which would outline, I think, or evaluate one piece of it. and. When we talk about transportation, it's not just water access points, it's our entire transportation system. So it's a, it's a fairly weighty topic and this is one important piece thereof. But the notion of taking a look at all of our water access points, identifying where our pinch points are and where we need, um, where we need uh, uh, additional parking facilities. And I think Councillor Roberts was, was right in his assessment of those types of things, if we do need to acquire land, will cost money. So that was his point with respect to um, budget implications. So having said that, Mr. Chair, I, I think that you know, staff would be pleased to come back with uh, sort of an, uh, you know, an articulation of that um, and uh, anticipated timeframes. But, um, and if there is a desire to include interim solutions in that kind of a report, uh, we'd be happy based on further conversation this morning to include those identified areas uh, uh, that you wish us to look at it in the interim. Um, and, and just one more point, uh, through the evaluation of the official plan, there will be ample opportunity for input from all members of the community. Um, there will be further drafts of that document so that people can weigh in, come to the table, discuss it, kick it around, uh, advise us of their uh, thoughts on those policies. 
Uh, and the same would be true through uh, public input or engagement opportunities uh, in the uh, master transportation plan uh, next year. Thank you. Good, thank you, CAO. And that gives you a little bit of a, a look forward. Thank you for that. I think there's a lot of people will take solace in some of those comments. Clearly, uh, hot topic. Clearly, we understand. Clearly, we want a solution to this. Uh, and it's a very large issue. I'm going to let uh, Councillor Mazan have a secondary supplemental uh, thought. Uh, thank you. And uh, through you again. Uh, so that is the path forward. And I think the request in there is to include a portion of this, I guess, staff report coming back some interim solutions, because there are some site specific areas that have been directly impacted by either decisions or conditions that have changed. And uh, I think that, you know, what we've all experienced over the last four or five weeks is, um, is the reality that there's part of our community that has been hurt um, on both sides, right? And uh, if there's nothing I've been hearing is the importance of public engagement. So that leads me to my second portion. I, I really have heard from our island community that maybe their needs aren't always as understood. And I think that that's really important. So for those who are on this call, I think it is important that you guys come together and have a voice that as our CAO has actually just laid out for us. And we are just contemplating draft two of our official plan tomorrow um, to really talk about water access and the needs of the island community. So I, you know, I do throw that out to the island community, it is important. And uh, we will look for your input and engagement as we move forward. Um, so coming back to the sec third piece, so I do support the idea of having some interim solution in some of these high pressure points right now and would welcome that from staff. Um, the final piece, and I just wanted to touch upon this because I think uh, CAO Hammond, when you were talking, um, I think one of the things that is important is we're contemplating uh, water access as a whole and that can involve a, co a combination or a balance between public and private solutions. And that's part of the thing that we need to be thinking about and contemplating. So this isn't a matter of us just pushing things off to all the marinas to find solutions. I think we have to be looking at it in a more global way. So I just wanted confirmation, CAO Hammond, that that is what you were also saying. I just wanted Okay, I'm going to let Derek have that last word on that. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, to the councillor's question. So the notion of official plan policy, permissive policies that would allow the development of these types of facilities would address the, the private initiatives, if you will, and the, uh, the uh, um, master transportation would look at public facilities, so the, the other side of the solution. Before I go to our last two presenters, uh, uh, Councillor Bridgman and Councillor uh, Roberts, I would sort of echo the comments of the uh, uh, staff, staff report coming forward, just to plant that in everyone's mind. We'll hear our last two fine folks, and then we'll, we'll move on. So, Councillor Bridgman, me, go ahead. Excuse me, Chair. I have a totally different point to make on this, on this point. So okay, I, well, you're, you're right after uh, Councillor Bridgman. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Chair Zavitz. And actually, I, I was going to mention that I'd already earmarked uh, island access and uh, water access properties for our discussion tomorrow. So, um, but, but, and I, it's been a great discussion today. I, I would love to see an interim solution. My question, because I, my understanding, uh, Clerk Mortimer, is when we turned that down last, the, uh, a temporary solution to go back to where we were last month, we have to wait three months before we can bring this back to the table. Am I correct on that? Good morning. Um, until the minutes are uh, ratified by council today, um, there is the ability to reconsider it. But after the minutes are passed today, that uh, it would be, yes, three months. 
Okay, thank you. So we actually would have the ability this afternoon to have another look at that is what I'm hearing you say. So that was my that was my question. Thank you. Sorry again for optics. Um, what we would be discussing would be a staff report. I don't believe there's no motion going forward to to move this back to council again as it was attempted last month. So just for clarity, is that Council Bridgman, does that answer your question? It, it, it had nothing to do with the staff report. It had the decision we made last month that we could actually reverse and 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 allow uh, parking. That's my understanding, but I may be corrected on that. I I see head shaking, so maybe I, I'm really misunderstanding. Yeah, I haven't what I seen. Asked. I haven't seen or heard that uh, that appetite to to attempt to do that. Um, I would look to. Council or to committee at least, but maybe we can hear. We we'll take take that under advisement, uh, and and we'll get back to you on that. So, Councillor Roberts, and then the mayor. Thank you. No, this is the reason I brought this whole community up forward because the resolution at the last meeting was to go take the uh, take something directly from general finance to council, and that's what was de defeated. I supported the idea of a staff report, which was part of that move. But we never got there. So as far as a staff report for those two areas, uh, some people um, the delegated thought it was we, we were waiting for a staff report. We right. never gave direction to the staff report. The second one is that um, I just want to clarify from what I heard in the delegates coming on them. I heard from a few of them that the director of public works and our fire chief said it in their opinion it was safe to. Uh, that road was safe. And I didn't hear that that from the director of public works or the fire chief. They, uh, what I did see was they were very careful in their wording. And then the third thing, just on the Bomar's point, um, and the two hour parking or parking was enacted in 2002, 2002.105 um, uh, uh, schedule D that implemented the two hour parking and parking. So parking has been in Bomaris for years or, or no parking allowed. So I wanted to make sure that was clear. All right. So it's not a recent thing. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mayor. And then we'll wrap this up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just a point of clarification, I, I, I'd like to uh, dive back into the resolution from last uh, council um, or uh, the ability for council. The um, uh, And we'll get back to it more at this afternoon's council meeting. Uh, but I, I would argue, Madam Clerk, that we actually never voted on a resolution. We voted on a motion to consider a resolution. Um, and that in itself got turned down, which is every prerogative. That doesn't mean we turn down the actual resolution. We just turn down the ability to vote on the resolution. But I, I won't uh, contradict now. Maybe we can just circle back on that for this afternoon's meeting and have uh, better advice before we approve the minutes. Thank you. Cheryl, would you like to comment on that? Uh, we'll get Cheryl, Cheryl Mortimer to comment. The clerk, thanks. You, you're correct. There was a motion proposed as put on the table by yourself and Councillor Mazan. We, uh, it was not on the agenda and it was not on the supplementary agenda. So we had to consider a motion that required a two thirds vote to um, uh, consider that motion, the motion for the two thirds vote to consider the motion failed. So that specific motion that was proposed was not voted on. However, um, in general, what I'm saying is it once the minutes are passed, then matters are not, uh, you cannot reconsider. So in a general sense, um, but with respect to that matter, um, any matter can be considered upon suspending your own rules. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, so sorry. So to move this on, to move this ahead, um, what I'm getting is a general sort of feeling that uh, certainly uh, we're supportive of a staff report coming forward in the uh, foreseeable future on this issue. Uh, I, I can't really speak to the immediacy piece of that. And I, I, perhaps we could look to the CAO to that, but at, at this point in time, what I'm understanding or feeling is that this committee would support uh, the request for a, 
uh, a fulsome staff report on this issue, very specifically these two location issues, that being Bill Morris and Marina Road at Walker's Point. Um, is that a general consensus uh, committee? Can I sort of see that? Yes, I'm seeing that. Okay, good. I'm seeing a general. So, okay, Councillor Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. I'm I'm very supportive of, of, of a staff report for to go forward and for look for a solution for um, you know to consider a solution for both Myers and Marina Road. But the, the the main theme of the staff report is what uh, our our CAO mentioned that he proposed that we do for a future solution for all of the scope. Right, okay. Carrie. <laughs> Thank you, and he'll have a comment. Uh, so, Councillor Hayes, go ahead. Yes, I'm, I'm just going to agree with Councillor Roberts. If, if you look at one piece, which we have done in the past, you're, you're creating different problems in different areas. Um, a solution in one problem creates a, a problem in another area. You have to look at the entire township of Muskoka Lakes and the parking that's needed and um, that, that's the only way that you can actually solve the parking issues is by looking at it in its totality. Okay, Does, I'm gonna let the uh, CAO chime in, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So that uh, staff and, and committee is clear, my understanding of what you're requesting is uh, to Councillor Hayes' point, sort of that addressing the entire enchilada in terms of what is that future plan. And you've asked us to report on two specific situations uh, in so far as what is, what is the interim solution until we get to that point where we've got OP policies in place that are more permissive and we've got uh, the results of a transportation master plan. Committee, do we have any sense of, uh, I think to what the, the summary that was just provided to us by the CAO, um, I guess that would be certainly a, a long, short-term to a long-term piece. So uh, obviously we're talking in 2022 about the transportation master plan and how this would feed feed into, I mean, that his use, use the word enchilada. That's a big, this is a big, this is a big issue. You know, I, I can't see a staff report in two months coming back saying, here's the solutions to island parking in the township of Muskoka Lakes. There ain't no way that's happening. So I would think that we need to be realistic about this. I think that we need to uh, look at this in a wholesome manner. That being these two locations, if people have come forward, given of their time, their delegates, they would like to see at least at, at, at very least, they would like to see reports through staff that indicate the reasoning behind all, all of this and possible solutions there. The bigger picture will be OP uh, 2022 master plan. Um, do we have a, do I have sort of a, can I get sort of a consensus amongst you that there would be a staff report over the next month or two, couple of months uh, in the foreseeable future, very specific to this, but then looking at some of the larger issues as it drafts into next year's plan. Can I get us, because I don't have a resolution to read. So I'm looking for some sort of consensus, Gord. I see you're, you're looking completely confused. What would you like to see, Gord? Just, I, I just I, want to I, repeat it, both. You'd like to see both? Yes. Oh, oh, okay. And, and, okay, fair enough. Fair enough, good. Okay, so do, does everyone else feel the same way as Gord, that the uh, Councillor Roberts at least, that we would uh, ask for a, a fulsome staff report on parking um, in the township of Muskoka Lakes. And it would be at, um, I guess at the call of the CAO who's got, now got his hand up as to when we might see that report. So I'm gonna ask the CAO to chime in. So Mr. Chair, to, to Councillor Roberts' point, so we understand what uh, committee's asking for. It's, it's not gonna be providing the long-term solutions. It's the process to achieve those solutions or arrive at those solutions. And uh, what are the interim solutions for these two uh, particular examples that committee is very interested in? So we understand that. Um, and uh, as, as the chair has alluded, uh, we will try and uh, um, get that report back uh, to committee as quickly as possible over the next few months. Thank you so much. 
Okay, with that statement, I see no other hands. I see no hands up. I, I believe we've had that discussion. The, the CAO has made a commitment to this committee and to these delegates, and uh, we'll follow up uh, at the next meeting or two or three, whatever it happens to be. Please stay tuned and we'll keep you apprised of the situation. So thank you committee for that. And we're gonna move on item 5B. A report from the Director of Public Works regarding co contractor performance management policies. There's a report and some attachments in your uh, your documents. Thank you, Director Becking. Welcome. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the report uh, presents a uh, proposed policy to uh, address the issue of uh, contractor performance uh, in the spirit of continuous improvement. Um, the staff are proposing this uh, approach to, to managing the performance of our contractors uh, in a, with a view to uh, improving performance uh, over time, as well as um, uh, dealing with issues in a, in a constructive way. Um, the uh, policy would uh, review each contract's performance um, against uh, five criteria, which are listed in the report. Uh, ratings would be assigned and um, with uh, on a scale of one to five with three being the level of acceptability. Anything above that, of course, would, would be uh, superlative um, performance. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, anything below a three uh, would be areas that would re, we would be requiring improvement uh, from the contractor. Um, as I indicate uh, in the report, uh, our objective here is to, over time, improve the performance of, of uh, the uh, group of, of uh, resources that uh, we rely on heavily to achieve Council's objectives over uh, the course of your term, and um, and uh, this process has been successfully used in in uh, in other locations throughout the province. Uh, where uh, we are unsuccessful in in obtaining the improvements, then there are uh, there are allowances for uh, measures so that uh, uh, if there are bad actors, then we can deal with those. Um, uh, in an, uh, an approved way. Um, obviously, uh, there has to be the right of appeal, and uh, ultimately, that right of appeal rests with this uh, with this group and and with council as a whole. So, with that, Mr. Chairman, um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Good, thank you. Great report, and uh, I would certainly support anything that gives you more tools for your toolbox, sir, as you move move forward. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Through you to Mr. Becking, can do you have any idea uh, how much extra time this will take from your staff? Um, I like the idea of having expectations clearly stated and communication and a grading, a consequence. Uh, but I'm just wondering about staff time, how much of it is going to be used? Certainly, um, the intent is that, that the uh, evaluations would be conducted by uh, the people who are closest to the, uh, the project. Um, the evaluation itself can be done, you know, an hour or, or at most two um, in most instances where there are difficulties. Um, it, might, uh, it might become a little bit more onerous. Obviously, if, if things get escalated up, that would, would also uh, add to the timeframes. I would suggest that given uh, our current staffing and uh, assuming a normal uh, relationship, it shouldn't become uh, overly onerous. Thank you. Thank you. I believe the CAO would like to make a comment. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just to add to Mr. Becking's comments, uh, Councillor Hayes, uh, staff are already investing time in, in sort of leading or managing consultants as the case may be. So really this just in some cases formalizes the process. And, you know, it's like most things when you've got a contractor that uh, requires more attention, 
that time is, is already being spent, if you will. And I think this sort of formalizes or brings more formality to that kind of an arrangement. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Roberts has a question, thought. Oh, yeah, a thought, yes. Thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, uh, I, I fully support um, what, uh, what uh, uh, Director Beckney has put forth and is, it's much needed. But I think we, are, 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 we need to do something before this. Um, as many of you are aware, um, I work for the Regional Appeal um, in uh, project management. And um, com compared to Bell Canada and CGI, they have an excellent process for project management with excellent tools and templates. I was really impressed when I was working um, in IT for the Regional Appeal. So there is one that, I, that comes to mind right off the bat, which would help um, uh, with the evaluation of contractors. And it's a template where you take your work plan, you, you then for each key milestone and the project is, uh, team and the executives decide which are the key milestones, you have, writ have a written document that specifically um, documents what will be done and the measurement of success so that you know that you've done that piece of work. And I encourage the, the, the district or the district, the township to reach out to the region appeal. All this information is free from any municipality to see what tools, what tools they could use. Now, we are not a, as large as the region appeal, but I think we can learn from some of their, their, their great processes. And Good. So thank, you. Know, right? thank, thank you. And I would uh, go to uh, Ken, I'll give you the floor on that one. Um, how do you feel about the measurement piece? They, I suppose that is the holding the feet to the fire, the tools you, you have within this new um, uh, management policy. Can you speak to that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in response, uh, I think Councillor is correct that that um, what he's suggesting is an over is a portion of an overall approach to project management, which is is well defined. Um, I am aware of of some templates that are out there, uh, both from the municipal sector, but also through the Project Management Institute of uh, of North America, which is the other sort of overarching guiding body on these things and and uh, certainly we can uh, we can incorporate those into into our um, future management programs okay good thank you councillor roberts is that Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thumbs up. Thank you for that, sir. Well, I do have a resolution to read, and I, I would certainly proceed to do that. Moved by Councillor Bridgman, uh, seconded by Councillor Edwards, be it resolved the General Finance Committee recommend to Township Council that the corporate policy and procedure for the management of contractor performance as attached to the staff report entitled Contractor Performance Management Policy dated August 11th, 2021 be approved. All those in favor? Good, thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you, committee. Okay, item 6A, we're gonna call on our land and agreements coordinator regarding the license agreement application, Longview Investments Limited, rule 9-14-073-01, which is an item that was referred, referred back to the General Finance Committee at the July 14th, 2021 Council meeting. Um, go ahead. You have the floor. Oh, sorry. Cheryl's going to speak to it. Go ahead. So we have just placed the past staff report and the um, past resolution that was referred back to committee for um, consideration today. And we heard the delegates speak on the matter previously today. And I believe that they were recommend or requesting that this matter be deferred um, for further consideration by um, a land exchange um, option. So um, it's up to committee to uh, proceed or just direct how to proceed. Thank you.
Thanks, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just for fur further clarity, in addition to uh, Clerk Mortimer's comments, uh, and just so we're all clear, I believe what Mr. Ackerman is proposing is uh, an alternate route for the road allowance uh, to go to the other side of his property, and there would be a land exchange between the municipality and Mr. Ackerman. So I think uh, he's he's requesting a deferral um, to prepare a, doc, a, a a sketch, if you will, for committee to look at to determine whether or not committee would be interested in such a proposal. Thank you. Good. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Councillor Kelly. Then Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you through you. I, I uh, fully support uh, Mr. Ackerman's request for a deferral. I think this is hopefully the right way to solve a sticky problem. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it, it, we're a long way from having a solution, but I know uh, Mr. Ackerman has Mr. Leo Longo on the file. I believe he's retained someone, uh, Stefan, if I'm not mistaken, at Planscape. So, um, you know, if, if there ever was a solution that was going to be made without us, uh, necessarily disappointing one side or another. Uh, I think deferral on this and waiting to see what comes of their work uh, would be in our best interests. Good, thank you. Councillor Roberts. Um, I'm not in favor of a deferral. This has been going on for many months, a lot of staff time. I, I welcome the exchange of property, but one and the other don't, 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 are not connected. At the last meeting, we said, we, uh, we approved or um, that identified that the, our property needed to be put back into, uh, uh, need to be clean, cleaned up and restored to natural. That was the decision. And today we are here to uh, talk about the, the sewage line that runs on our property. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, um, Madam Clerk. We are here to uh, talk about the encroachment of the walkway and of the deck. I think those are the three three things that we're here that is on the plate today. Nothing to do with our township property. Am I correct or am I wrong? Well, you're not. You know, you're not wrong. I think new information has come to light, as Mr. Uh, Ackerman has uh, recently shared with us. And so the 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 two are not actually mutually uh, independent, because if there is a land swap, as we've entertained elsewhere, then there's, you know, what's on that property at this point in time won't matter in two and a half to four months when the deferral unfolds and they come to us with a plan and uh, we look at it again. I mean, if I ask committee, and I won't quite yet, but uh, if I ask committee if they prefer a deferral, uh, I have two resolutions here to read, um, and you can see where we've we've been stuck, and that's why this thing is back with us yet again. Um, I, I might say, uh, you know what? I'm, I won't say. I'll leave it for now. But I'll let, let Councillor Hayes comment, and then we'll get back to that. Thank you. I would be in favor of the deferral and listening to what they have to offer. And in the meantime, our staff will not have to do the work um, to get this in order. If Because if we're going to change it anyway, and that is a big if, uh, why have staff work when they have better things to do on something that will never go forward? Yeah, well, well said. Thank you. I'll let the mayor have a final word and then we'll move on with this. Thank you. I guess my question is to staff um, from a timing perspective. You know, we have been that Council Roberts says we've had this for a few months now back and forth. Um, you know, if if they're successful in purchasing land, is this another piece of land that may we may or may not want? Um, if the only reason we're doing this is so that the uh, landowner can keep a sewer line on our property. I know we have done this in the past. We did this with Muskoka Lakes to provide greater separation between a commercial operation um, of a golf club and a resort, uh, more family oriented or more guest oriented. Um, just, I, I'm a little concerned that we start moving road allowances. What's it connected to? What's it not connected to? Um, there, there's so many questions to, would we even approve this road allowance uh, as a land swap? Again, it's for the benefit of one. If, uh, you know, we, we do offer up that new piece of land, does it have to be offered up to the neighbor? Do we sell half of it to the neighbor? 
there, there's so many questions about this. Um, I'm, I'm really quite concerned. And uh, from a staff perspective, if, if we recommend, again, we're still at general finance, we've got 30 days to go forward. Um, the recommendation I don't believe has changed to remove the staircase, to remove the um, sewage line off our property. Uh, if Mr. Ackerman wants to make a change in the next 30 days, comes up with the land, it sort of sets the clock, but otherwise we could be at this three years from now. So that's my concern going forward. And I'm about a land swap. It's just, I'm not sure we're setting new precedent. Well, okay. So to your point, Mayor, before I ask uh, Councillor Edwards his commentary. Um, so <laughs> at the interest of, uh, you know, I, I responded to Mr. Ackerman, as everyone will recall, they all got an invitation uh, at this committee to go and attend his property. I did that. Uh, I also uh, visited it with Councillor Kelly. And I can tell you that what I did see was no ATVs, but lots of deer. So my, my premise here, my thought on this, and I certainly am a champion of a deferral, would be, um, and I guess going against almost all of your comments, Mayor, I don't know what kind of a precedent, we've already set a precedent with uh, Muskoka Lakes Country Club and uh, Shamrock Lodge. My point is, you've got a willing participant, you've got, you know, here we have a chance to get people to join hands. I think if you listen to Mr. Ackerman at the beginning, he, he had every, has every willingness to make this thing work. Um, if it ultimately in two two months, if we come back from a deferral and he can't make it work, then you know what? I'm going to read resolution and bam, it's a done deal. But right now, I can tell you that this road that we're talking about hasn't been used by a vehicle in, I don't know, 20 years. There's no ATV going up and down there giving him access to the lake. It's a complete billy goats course. We would be getting better land if he were to swap it <laughs> with us. But I mean, that's not for me to say, but... I did do my diligence as a counselor and I, I attended, I viewed it. And, and quite honestly, um, I would certainly support a deferral. Thank you, uh, Councillor Edwards, you go right ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Zabich. Um, the mayor is right. If it, if it did come up, we'd have to offer the neighbor the other half. So we would get in the half the road allowance maybe. And um, and that, but I would uh, go for a uh, deferral so we can work something out. But uh, I don't know if it, it, it will change in that because uh, uh, I I because of the way it is with the neighbors, I don't think and uh, that it would be uh, ideal given Mr. Ackerman the whole right away. The neighbor has rights too. Uh, with the uh, golf club, they own both sides of that right away. That's why they were able to to uh, give it to us. So there's. So some actual differences here in that. So, but I can uh, go for a uh, deferral. Thank you. Yeah, and and to that end, and perhaps uh, again, there there was uh, the uh, mention by Mr. Ackerman that, and I do believe it's probably part of the policy that he would, if we were to swap the land of the sixty six feet, thirty three feet of it would fall to the neighbor immediately. So, uh, and he's certainly willing to do that, and he told us he would pay for it. So he would pay for all the legal and whatever else. So, I mean, he is on record. Uh, perhaps uh, his presentation didn't, and here I am, I'm not really speaking on his behalf. I'm sort of looking at it as a, a larger picture. Here we have a chance to, to create a positive solution, a win-win. And I don't know why, and if, if it's just time, we don't, we don't grant that time. So to Councillor Edwards' point, I'm certainly in favor of a deferral. I might ask if uh, other council or other committee members might... Uh, uh, show me what I, I don't have an actual resolution to read on a deferral. It would be a simple uh, nodding of heads, I suppose, that there would be a majority of you that would grant a deferral for um, a period of time, whether that's two months or whatever. So, I mean, I, I guess I would just ask you as a committee right now, here and now, what, what do you think of that? That's in front of us. If it isn't, then it is. So Councillor Ishikawa, Councillor Edwards is saying yes, I'm going yes. Councillor Kelly, Councillor Bridgman. Okay, so there's six. Thank you. So Councillor Mazan, you do have a question. Go right ahead, hands up. Uh, thank you, it's for you. Uh, did I, 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 I'm seeking clarification. Is it possible to say we can defer not, uh, defer this, but for a period of time? Uh, sorry? So 60 days, it seems to be, um, 
the ex standard accepted uh, time period in terms of 260 days. Does that work for you? Okay, thank you? okay, good, thank you. Okay, so we did see a, a majority of uh, thumbs up. So uh, given that uh, I will not read the two resolutions that are in front of us today, we will grant a deferral uh, through this committee for let's call it 60 days and we'll invite Mr. Ackerman to come back at that time and uh, show us his plan. So, we, Yeah, so just in terms of direction to Mr. Ackerman, uh, Mr. Longo, if you're listening, we would need you to come forward and apply, uh, you know, to the township as you would. So that's a, a process piece to this, and uh, I'm sure that's of no problem uh, to to you. Um, if you need clarification, please reach out to uh, uh, Clerk uh, Cheryl Mortimer or CAO Derek Hammond on that regard. But uh, we've you've been granted a deferral. For 60 days. Thank you. Does that work? Okay, so we we want, we're wondering if we may need a resolution just to formalize this. So uh, I'm wondering if we could take 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay, so we're going to continue on. Um, our clerk will create a resolution. We'll come back to that. Um, and uh, vote on that again um, in that regard. Okay, so I'm gonna move on then to item 6B, which is the report from Land and Agreements uh, Coordinator as it relates to the license agreement application McDonald rule 2-24-72-40. Um, this item was referred back to us uh, at the July 14th meeting. And uh, go ahead, Cheryl, is that you gonna be you again? Sure. <laughs> sure, sure. So the, with the same um, as the previous report, uh, the motion to enact at council meeting last uh, time in July, the motion was referred back to committee um, as there was some questions with respect to the, um, I believe the impacted uh, construction of a road and which property it was. I believe that um, the applicant clarified some of those details this morning. I believe that um, perhaps the director of planning would um, have some comments on that or the um, bylaw enforcement officer. Uh, so staff are um, here to answer questions and the, the uh, applicant spoke and we are just seeking direction on how to proceed. Okay, committee, given that rationale and the report in front of you, uh, I'm gonna call on the mayor. mayor uh, thank you, just, just a question again, this was at council, which would have been ratified last month. It got referred back to general and finance. So we've already got a 30 day delay, depending if we uh, pass this at committee today, again, it's now a 60 day delay. Um, I am personally in favor of this. I, I am uh, supportive. I was at general finance two months ago. My question is, uh, number one, to committee, are we okay to potentially bring this to a ratification this afternoon, uh, assuming no other changes are in this? Um, you know, as we move this to mid-September from a timing perspective, some kind of construction to build this road and bridge, um, I'd like to try and keep this moving forward. So uh, we heard from the applicant, there is no issues about the other road that's being constructed within our bylaws, um, but this is an application before us that uh, I'd ask committee's indulgence to be able to, uh, with two thirds support, move this forward and approve it this afternoon. Okay, thank you. We'll pick up on that in a moment. Uh, Councillor Edwards, go ahead. Uh, Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not opposed to the bridge going in. Okay, I like to, some some clarification. That's all. First of all, the applicant has a dam there. He wants to to uh, to uh, close it off, and that he can do that without the road. And that it's just a case of putting a fence up. That's 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 item one. Secondly, if we are giving uh, a uh, a uh, license agreement, then we're giving basically a right-of-way, 
where's the right of way going? Okay. Is there a site plan approval for this? It's along the shoreline. And that that Lake uh, Clark's Pond is on the the uh, the uh, district's uh, thing for uh, having blue green algae, and that so it have to probably have a uh, environmental uh, report, and that so I would just like to know where this road is going. That's all I ever ask. I'm not opposed to a bridge going in, but I would like to know if if there's uh, an environmental assessment. If there's a site plan agreement and uh, a license agreement is is only good for the applicant and it has to be renewed if, if the property is sold uh if there was other lots put in there well, what would happen would they have uh, direct access that's all i've been asking uh and that there's more to this than that than just a, a license agreement for for one thing and okay. that, that's why i brought it up if Council wants to 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 vote it in. That's fine, and that. But I just wanted answers. I had a a uh, constituent uh, ask and that questions. That's why I uh, brought it up. As then, I'm not opposed to the bridge, but I want to know exactly what is uh, going on with this. That's all I've ever asked for. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So prior to calling on uh, Councillor Roberts, I would ask David Pink. David, you're you're on the call. Um, could you speak to uh, committee member Edwards' uh, queries and concerns? Thank you, David, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, welcome committee and uh, through you, uh, Chair Zavitz. Um, I, I guess I'm a little unclear uh, with committee members Edwards if you're referring to uh, what is occurring on the property where the road is being constructed or on the dam uh, where the bridge is being constructed. Uh, I don't believe uh, there is a site plan application in um, that uh, I can speak to at this time on, on either property. There's no development that's been proposed. Okay, I'm gonna let uh, Alan go ahead and speak. Yeah, okay, directly. thank you. Go ahead. Uh, David, no, I was just asking about the bridge. I'm not concerned about the other, it says a different property, that's fine. But, um, and that, uh, it's funny because this morning when I looked on, uh, on, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, mayor's post standing beside of a uh, some some blasted ground with uh, uh, himself and and other members of uh, staff members, and that and we've seen clear cutting and that before. Uh, we have blasting if 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 it's needed at the water's edge without within two hundred feet. We have clearing of 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 that. That's all I ever asked for is a clarification of what what was going on before we lease something. I think we should know what is going on for the simple fact that it's a license agreement. It's only good for the, the applicant. If, uh, if he's giving a right away to something else, there's more involved in it. And I just like a, maybe a legal opinion. Again, I'm not against the, 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 the bridge going in, but I would just like to know what is going uh, there. Has, has there been a site plan uh, asked for? on the other side of that bridge because you're going across our uh, shore road allowance onto a property uh, and that before anything is done, do we just say, okay, here's the bridge and, and, and go. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. So David, if I, I'm not sure if that uh, provides the clarity you require to give a, a more fulsome answer. Uh, are, are we saying in fact, that uh, this uh, what is in front of us today, 6B, is very purely a license agreement application and, and what it entails. So I'll let you go ahead, uh, David, and uh, if you can provide more insights to that, please do for Alan and the others. Uh, thank you. Um, through you, I, I cannot speak for the property owner, uh, but I believe, um, maybe I'm stand to be corrected, but I believe uh, when they delegated uh, in order to gain approval of general finance uh, two months ago, uh, that they did indicate the intention is the bridge in order to construct a cottage on the property on the North Shore. Um, I do not believe, uh, I believe the current zoning would allow or would require a site plan agreement before that dwelling would be permitted. I do not believe that application has been submitted as of yet. I'm also not aware, uh, I don't believe the property owner ever indicated or has applied for uh, a right of way over the bridge. I believe this uh, is for their personal use. And again, indicated uh, uh, when they delegated sure. to general finance that the intention is to construct 
a residence on the North Shore. Through the site plan control process, staff will, uh, as we do for all site plan applications and development, ensure that uh, the shoreline vegetative buffer is preserved and will require uh, any necessary studies if staff feels it's required or if they're required in accordance with official plan policies. Uh, okay, so um, do we have him here? Yeah. Sorry? Okay, so we should let him in. We can. Uh, Mr. McDonald or his agent Nick? Is it Nick Cronin? Okay, so both uh, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Cronin are here through Modern Technology Marble. So we uh, probably would ask uh, clarification of either gentleman to, uh, to, to that end. I wonder if you could speak to... Uh, yeah, already I see you're shaking your head. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to say, I don't think I could explain this in a manner that uh, Councillor Edwards could ever understand because he's put up so much nonsense, it's ridiculous. At one point he's saying, why doesn't he just put up a fence? So is he advocating that now I could start uh, uh, erecting structures okay. without any regard to bylaws or anything else? Like the road is different than the the bridge it's it's the road the and this his idea like I'm clear cutting and stuff. First, I, the road is being built outside. What you know what? Let me. Do you, you, is the bylaw the chief bylaw guy like he works for you guys, right? This is what he emailed me. This is in no way a caution of anything or this is no way a caution or anything of that sort, but more of me wanting to get some information on the future of that land. So we, if we do receive anything by way of further complaint, I can at least have that knowledge with me to advise any of anyone of what is happening and that everything is compliant. He went out and looked at it. We're following his directions on how to build that laneway. I'm not intending on clear cutting. I could, frankly. I mean, I think I'm within my rights if I wanted to, but that has never been my intent for the property. I'm trying to preserve it. I've been off, people have offered to buy lots on that land several times. And I don't want to do that. I'm from a big family. I want to preserve it as naturally as I possibly can. And I am going to have some cottage uh, structures on it for my private use. Um, this idea that I'm building a subdivision and then why don't I just construct a fence like okay, on top of okay. it? It's, okay. it's so, ridiculous. Okay. And the two have been conflated in the most absolutely ridiculous okay. way. Okay. Well, that's great. Mr. McDonald, within within reason, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to we're trying to eat this all of them one bite at a time. So I think if we go, go back to our beginnings, listen, thank you for your your presence. Um, I think, there, you know, there are a number of issues at play here. I think we're going to micro this thing and just stay right at uh, the land uh, agreement uh, with you, license agreement with you, and uh, I'll deal with that now. So uh, I would thank you for, you know, it is what it is. There, there is a there is a position, and we need to understand it. I don't know, if David. I would ask, actually say, David, if you have any comments, you're welcome to. Yeah, Nicholas Nick. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and there's a thought too. So if Nick could clarify or, or, or David, uh, Nick, perhaps uh, if you could clarify what you, uh, in some sort of a summary very quickly to uh, wrap our brains around this thing in a bigger picture. Sure, I can make a comment. Um, the, the, the only thing planned across the bridge is a residential cottage. Is a family one one family residential cottage, and perhaps a boathouse if uh, that is allowed within the bylaws. But again, we're not planning to do multiple properties or subdivide um, any of John McDonald's land holdings. Um, he is intending to preserve it as naturally as possible, um, and anything we do will fall within the regulations of the township um, as they stand. Okay, good. Thank you. Gentlemen, I'm going to uh, let you out. I'm going to call on uh, Councillor Roberts as a comment, and then we'll wrap this up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, for your patience. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, De Director Pink answered my questions. My concern uh, and, and was with the use of the, of, of the bridge for private use. And it is my understanding that if it changed from now, after Director Bink, Bink had spoke, if it changes anything from private use, then the applicant um, would have to come back 
um, and, and uh, reapply for his uh, license agreement and maybe some other things. And that's that's my understanding. So um, I hope if it's right, I'm okay. David? I'd, I'd let you comment on that, David. Sure, go ahead. Um, yes, I believe uh, the applicant did indicate it. It's for private use. If they wanted to come back uh, to the municipality and propose that the road could be accessed or right-of-way over it in favor of other properties, a right-of-way application would have to be made to the municipality to permit that. Okay, thank you, David, for that clar clarity. And I'm gonna read a resolution here, moved by seeing no other hands, moved by Councillor Bridgman, uh, seconded by Councillor Mazan, be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend to Township Council that the June 16, 2021 General Finance Committee resolution number GFC-4-16-06-21 license agreement application McDonald, roll number 2-24-072-40, be enacted. All those in favor? Yeah. Councilor Kelly is not here to vote. Seven, all those opposed? All of, anyone opposed? Okay, one opposed. Carried, thank you. Now to, I suppose to the mayor's point, um, Committee, we'll need uh, a vote with Councillor Kelly here, probably. Uh, am I right to do a two thirds? We need a, to get to this afternoon's council meeting. We're going to need two thirds of us to approve that that move, that motion, at the at the meeting this afternoon. So we have to do it now, right? No. This afternoon we have. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Fine. Sorry. Process. So this afternoon we will entertain that, that notion, if you will. Uh, Mayor Harding, is that okay? Did that get your hand down? Good. Cool. Great. Okay. So uh, everyone is clear on that this afternoon. It will come forward again and we'll discuss it at council and see what the appetite is to, to move it right into council and approve it this afternoon. One might think or not. Okay. Thank you. For that, uh, moving on to item 6C, it's a report from Human Resources Manager regarding a compensation administration policy. There's Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. And uh, you have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Avitz, members of the committee. So you have before you a compensation administration policy for approval. It's a consolidation of three existing policies from the employee handbook and an update to the consumer price index month that we have been using for the cost of living adjustment. The intention of using the consumer price index to recommend an economic adjustment is to have an objective data point um, from a respected resource such as St Statistics Canada Council maintains the authority to modify the final economic adjustment during the budget process if it is felt to be out of line with the economic climate. If approved, it's also being recommended to adjust uh, to align the council remuneration policy to use the same CPI month. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, sir. Committee, any thoughts, questions? Hopefully we've done our homework. We've read that. It looks like a good report and uh, it's necessary. I have a, a resolution here moved by Councillor Kelly, uh, seconded by Councillor Hayes, uh, be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend to Township Council that the compensation administration policy as attached to the staff report entitled Compensation Administration Policy dated August 11, 2021 be approved and that the related sections of the employee handbook brackets, salary administration principles, annual increases and increases for additional work, uh, comma pages 10 and 11 be repealed, and that the word October in section 1B of policy C-GG-11, council remuneration and expense policy be changed to the word August. All those in favor? Oh, are we okay, good. Good, thank you. Carrie. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, okay, report from, uh, so thank you, sir. 
a report from the Director of Financial Services uh, regarding 2022 budget guidelines. Looking forward to this report. Welcome, Mr. Donaldson. You have the floor. Great, thank you, uh, Chair Zavitz, and good afternoon, committee members. We are past the noon hour. Um, before you was a report seeking the committee's approval for the 2022 budget guidelines. Uh, staff are recommending a guideline of a 5% net levy increase over the 2021 budget levy for the 2022 fiscal year. In dollars, 5% equates approximately, approximately to about $630,000. Of this, the increase uh, allocated to the township's operating expenses would be one and a half percent, which in dollars comes into about around 190,000 at uh, supporting current service levels. And the remaining three and a half percent, which would be around $440,000 would represent an increase in the transfer to reserves over what we contributed in our 2021 budget. Uh, when factoring in the projected estimated property tax assessment, uh, that would be used for 2022 taxes. The overall rate increase, uh, actual rate increase would be 3.7%, which is about $22.70 on a $500,000 property. So just to get that order of magnitude, um, the current working assumptions for the budget preparation would be included in the report. Um, staff are also recommending some changes, some modifications to the reporting, the reports themselves for the budget based on feedback received through the 2021 budget process. Uh, the proposed changes would allow the or make the operating and capital reports uh, much more readable and user friendly. Uh, also new this year in terms of the budget preparation process, uh, we'll be going to open up our Engage Muskoka Lakes uh, platform right away uh, to be able to hear from the public their ideas, which can help inform the draft budget that will come to committee uh, later this year. The ideas submitted will be included as part of a future staff report on the budget. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions on this. Excellent. Thank you very much for that report. Refreshing to see a report like this in August. So thank you very much for that. Um, I read the report. I don't know. Um, uh, one of the questions I would have, if I might, uh, before I don't see any hands, but uh, wanted just to make sure that uh, Councillor Jaglowitz uh, did communicate with me and wanted to, I just wanted to make sure, if you will, that you had, and he had had sufficient dialogue and had satisfied a couple of his uh, references. Mark, could you speak to that? I, I did speak with the counselor yesterday. Um, he did uh, clarify a couple of questions <laughs> regarding the one and a half and the three and a half percent that I uh, referenced earlier with respect to how much is operating and how much would be targeted for, um, for reserves. Uh, and in terms of just clarifying that this, this would be at current service level. So anything that would come forward as what we termed in 2021 as a la carte or additional services would be incremental to this uh, in the event that we are not able to find offsets within the existing budget allocation. Okay, good, good. Okay, listen, I have a, uh, seeing no hands, I do have a, a motion here, moved by Mayor Harding, seconded by Councillor Bridgman, be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend a Township Council that staff prepare a draft 2022 operating budget using a budget guideline for an increase in the net required operating levy over the 2021 budget of 5%, and that staff prepare a two-year operating forecast for 2023 and 2024 using reasonable and prudent assumptions, and that staff prepare a 10-year capital budget and forecast from 2022 to 2031 and that staff prepare a capital financing plan and a 10 year fund reserve budget and forecast to support the township's financial sustainability. Um, before I call the vote, I'll ask the mayor's comment, question, go ahead. Uh, thank you, just a comment. Um, and again, I'll support 5% right now. I still think personally, we might be a little bit high. And uh, as we go through this process, uh, just for uh, Director Donaldson, uh, don't be alarmed if I, uh, in draft one or draft two, try to tweak a little bit to get down to, let's say, a 4% comfortable number, but uh, I'll leave it at uh, that right now. Just uh, one of my comments to be known. Good. And I, I do think that might be a prevailing comment. Thank you for that. Uh, but we certainly do feel giving um, our financial folks the latitude right now to get this thing on the dance floor is, uh, is prudent. So um, uh, with that, I would call the vote. Uh, all those in favor of this report. 
Good, thank you. That's carried. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Mark. And you're up again. You have a Q2 financial update. So go ahead, sir. Thank, thank you, Chair Zavitz. Uh, the Q2 report uh, to June 30th has been provided for information to members. Um, just some quick uh, comments. Revenues have performed well against the budget so far this year. Uh, as we're all very well aware, the planning area's revenues are very strong uh, based on a very high volume of activity. Um, conversely, the recreation areas, because they have not been able to be open during the pandemic, uh, have not uh, generated as much, but we're hoping for some experienced uh, rebounds in the, in the second half of the year. Expenses, again, are tracking against our budget uh, quite well. Um, results continue to be monitored on a regular basis by staff to ensure that we're, we're being uh, prudent with, with taxpayers' money. Our capital expenditures are showing as very underspent, uh, but I can assure Council that there is a lot of activity. Of course, there were a number of items that came to Council in April, uh, some big ticket items, some, some trucks, a plow, uh, Milford Bay Bridge, a number of big uh, ticket items that just haven't been uh, invoiced yet. So that's why we're not seeing those costs, but there, there certainly will be a, an influx of, of capital expenditures as we go through the rest of the year. Um, and the reserve balance is just as a, as a point in time update, and it has been restructured uh, on the pending bylaws format, uh, pending uh, that approval, but just to give people, uh, members uh, of the committee a, a sense of what that, what that looks like and where we're at, but certainly there will be draws from the reserve as those capital expenses come through in the latter part of the year. Um, and uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions on Q2. Good. Committee, any thoughts? Oh, there's uh, Councilor Bridgman. Go ahead, Barb. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Zavitz. I know we're trying to move along. I think I probably speak for almost everybody. I'm delighted to see this. It's so nice to have an update that is timely, et cetera. So thank you very much, Mark. Excellent. Ditto. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, seeing no other comments, I uh, will take this report uh, under advisement. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you for that. I will now call on uh, item 7A, which is a report from the fire chief for C-LS-02 flag protocol policy update. Brian, Chief Morrell, go ahead. Thank you through you. Uh, uh, good morning, or I guess good afternoon committee. Uh, the first uh, report that's in front of you is a flag protocol policy update. Uh, this uh, update follows an increase in public requests to half-mast the flag at various fire halls. Staff investigated various flag protocol policies with a view to determining options to amend the current policy. In front of you, the proposed policy enables honoring members of the Canadian Forces, any municipal fire police service, and past fire service members at their local fire station. Also in this policy, it has been uh, updated to consolidate the criteria to recognize requests from community groups and charities. I stand for questions. Okay, committee, questions of the chief. Uh, Mayor Harding, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as I understand the policy a little bit, um, uh, many of the uh, flag raising situations will have to come to council. I don't think we're delegating very much to staff. Um, I'm wondering whether or not that's really a prudent use of our council's time and staff time to write a report um, or can we let staff uh, be delegated some of these uh, local community decisions along the way? And uh, I put that out there to your comments to uh, Chief Morrell or our CAO Hammond. I believe the new policy addresses a lot of that delegation, but I do note inside the policy itself, there is a provision in there to take some uh, requests to council. And uh, I just have to find okay. Exactly we'll let our clerk speak to that. Chief, would, Cheryl would like to speak to that. Thank you. For clarity, the policy is um, the same as the current. It's just that um, if we haven't received a, an approval from council within uh, a five-year time period, then we need to um, come back to council for approval. Um, if if council does pass a motion, then staff are delegated the authority to um, approve those um, on the in-between years. So there is delegated authority, just like we did with the um, recent um, flag raising 
we had to come back to council at the last meeting to get approval because it had been five years. I hope that provides clarity. Good, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, and I'm gonna let the CAO just chime in on that. Thank you. So a question of clarity from the mayor. So if I understand your question, based on what we just heard from Clerk Mortimer, you're, are you suggesting that if there's black and white criteria in the policy, that that decision with respect to fly a community flag, um, rather than having it go to council, that should be something that staff have the authority to make a decision on based on the policy. And if there's any questions, it would then go to council. Thank you. Mayor, go ahead. Um, that would be my assumption that, you know, we, we do know some of these are gonna be very black and white. They meet a number of criteria and I don't believe that those need to come to council and certainly don't need to come to council every five years. Um, I think if there's ever a question, our staff are uh, educated enough and realize enough, this is something that uh, should come to council and that uh, council can chime in on at which point the five-year uh, uh, window can be adopted. But, uh, you know, again, we've talked a lot about uh, workloads and every time, you know, Bob's Pizza or Bob's Pizza for Charity wants to raise a flag, uh, I'm not sure that uh, it's prudent use of this council's time. Picking up on that point, um, I wonder if committee uh, feels the same way. Would committee have an appetite to uh, perhaps uh, allay some of that responsibility back to over to staff and we could read a resolution that would, as outlined in revised appendix three. Is that a solution for many of you? Is that something that we might entertain as a committee? Anybody I'm seeing a uh, is that okay? Is that something that we might consider? Maybe a thumbs up or, okay, good. I'm seeing a few people, mayor thumbs up. So I've got four. Okay, good, good. So it seems that we have a consensus. At least we have a majority that would be willing to uh, counsel. So I'm gonna let the, the CAO just chime in here to put a fine point on it. Thank you. So Mr. Chair, uh, if, if uh... If that's the wish of committee, staff can amend the policy in that respect prior to it coming to council. So to move the matter along, that could be done uh, between now and, and council. So the resolution would just need to be amended to say, I believe, subject to the clerk comments uh, as amended. <laughs> uh, well, that is crazy. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a thought. <laughs> okay, we, we can simply uh, amend the, the uh, motion that I've got in front of me. And I, I think I would simply uh, proceed to read that given the previous comments, right? I'm just going to, uh, as a minute, yeah. So uh, moved by Councilor Edwards, seconded by Councilor Nishikawa, be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommended Township Council that the updated Township Flag Protocol Policy C-LS-02 as outlined in Appendix 3 to the staff report entitled Flag Protocol Policy and dated August 11th, 2021, be approved as amended. All those in favor? Okay, we got some freezing going on here. It looks like it's unanimous. Oh, Councillor Mazan. See, we're frozen here. Okay, there we go. Good. Okay. Okay, thank you. It's carried. Well, I'll just initial that. Okay, so there we go. So, uh, okay, Chief Morell, once again, uh, the addition of rescue of animal in distress to bylaw 2016-125. Sir, you've got the floor, go ahead. Through you, Chair Zavitz, to committee. Uh, as committee may be aware. You're muted, right? Sorry. Sorry, um, I believe I'm, can you hear me? Or am I muted? Yeah. Uh, I'll proceed. Can you hear me, Chair Zavitz? What's it? Okay, go. Okay, technical difficulty. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, Chief. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, as committee may be aware, Ontario's Provincial Animal Welfare Services Act, also known as PAWS, 
uh, came into effect January 1st, 2020. This allows authorities to remove animals that are in critical distress due to heat or cold that are found in vehicles. Um, also during these emergencies, fire services may be called upon to make or enact quick removal of these distressed pets. As a part of this, in the Fire Prevention and Protection Act, in order to afford the authority to fire services to do this, uh, fire services have to include in uh, the authority in their own established and regulating bylaw. That is what is before council today. That is the amendment that uh, we are proposing. I stand for questions. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, committee, well, anything on that? Any observations? We've all read up on that. Okay, I have a resolution to read. Moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Mazan, be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend to Council the draft bylaw 2021 XXX, the effect of which is to amend section 12E of bylaw 2016 125, as attached to the staff report entitled Addition of Rescue of Animal in Distress to bylaw 2016 125, dated August 11, 2021, be given three readings. All those in favor? Okay, sure, good, good, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chief Morell. Uh, there are minutes of the Recreation Parks, Trails and Facilities Master Plan Steering Committee. Uh, minutes are included in your agenda. I wonder if the chair would, uh, or, or uh, Mr. Becking, Public Works wanna speak to those minutes? You're welcome, you have the floor. Either. I don't know if there. Oh, yep. Yeah, Director Becking can take the lead. Thank you. Good. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the consultant is is making good progress. Um, the uh, inventory and and background information collection is is well advanced. Um, in addition to that, we've now moved into the public consultation phase. Uh, we have uh, solicited comments from the hall boards. Uh, we have undertaken a user group uh, survey, which is uh, currently underway. It was uh, initiated uh, earlier this week, and already I understand as of this morning, we had 11 responses. So uh, that's, uh, that's a good indication. Um, we have also initiated some um, pilot um, inquiries or surveys of users um, in select uh, parks and trails um, to get uh, get information on who is using our, our facilities and uh, what the uh, nature of their user experience is. So um, process is, is moving forward um, and, uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, further engagement with the public as we move forward. Thank you. Good, thank you. Councilor Mazan, would you like to, Chair Mazan, would you like to chime in there? Uh, thank you. I think uh, uh, Director Becking has really laid out where we're at with it. I think the big thing for this group to know and understand is the public engagement process is starting to happen. And um, that includes this group. So I think that uh, Director Becking, as part of the user group council, is being uh, I think, and maybe I need, I need to regroup with you on that, Director Becking, you didn't mention that the consultant will be reaching out to council in the next, within the next month or so. Is that, that is correct? correct? That okay. is correct, Mr. Mr. Chairman. That, that was a, a significant thing. And then coming out of the user group survey, there will be a following public survey. So we, we wanted to be sure this group is aware of the engagement process and that it's going to be very inclusive and uh, Director Becking will continue to send out communications uh, to this group to let you know um, if, if, there's, if there's items that are being sent out so there's no surprise at this. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, excellent. Uh, item, moving right along, item 8A, which is Economic Development and Grants. Um, Report from Corey Moore, our communication economic development specialist regarding the public art policy. Uh, good morning, sir. Welcome, you've got the floor. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Chair Zavitz. Um, 
As committee will recall, uh, staff were directed to return to committee with a policy regarding public art donations. Uh, the policy itself can be found uh, as Appendix 1 to the report. To, uh, to highlight it, uh, the policy itself, it takes a similar approach to our municipal grants program uh, in which a committee will be appointed every four years uh, to review uh, public art uh, donations and, uh, and make recommendations, answer any questions, uh, your chair. Good, thank you. Committee. I'll say, okay, seeing no, no questions, no comments. Okay, thank you for that report, sir. Uh, moved by Councilor Nishikawa, seconded by Councilor Mazan, be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommended Township Council that the public art policy as outlined in the staff report entitled Public Art Policy and dated August 11, 2021 be approved and that the responsibility for the review of public art donations in accordance with the public art policy be assigned to the Grants and Economic Development Advisory Committee. All those in favor? Perfect. Good, thank you. Carried. I'll just uh, go back for one second before we go to uh, district municipality updates from our three folks in attendance here. Uh, I would go back to um, the earlier item, Longview Investments. I have a, a motion here that, that I would read that we need to uh, just do some paperwork on. Moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend a Township Council that reconsideration of the defeated June 16, 2021 General Finance Committee Resolution number GFC-2-160621 be deferred for 60 days based on the request from the applicant license agreement application Longview Investments Limited Rule 9-14-073-01. All those in favor? Okay, good, thank you. Sorry? Okay, okay, all those opposed? Councilor Roberts. Okay, that's carried, thank you. Appreciate your indulgence. Okay, um, uh, if there's any unfinished business, uh, I would ask you, you here and now, if there is anything uh, to be discussed, no? Okay, I see none. Uh, under new business, I would invite uh, our mayor with his good news and other news uh, as our district municipality Muskoka updates. Go ahead, Phil, thank you. Uh, thank you. We had a public works meeting July 21st, um, dealt with some safe roads campaign stuff, um, award a number of small contracts, nothing significant, uh, some water main replacements. Um, we are looking at a, what's called a cross connection uh, bylaw or, or a program, if you will. Uh, basically, if uh, a home or we are to depressurize the system, especially in the commercial applications that are connected to our sewer and water. It can draw water back out of the commercial facility, which could contaminate our water source. So they make things like backflow preventers to stop that. And we are gonna be working across the district to implement a policy. Um, it's not so much an issue on a personal home use, but it certainly is an issue on a commercial and industrial use. Um, that's really the, the topic of our engineering public works. Uh, I did reference earlier, uh, this morning, we issued a press release that we have terminated uh, or are in the process of terminating our contract with our solid waste provider, Waste Connections. Uh, for those uh, who've been around for the past few years, we know that we've had numerous issues uh, regarding our solid waste, missed collection pickups, um, and uh, many, many, many more issues. Um, we will be putting out an RFP for a new uh, contractor, we should be able to award that before Christmas with anticipation that fall of 2023, no, we're in 2021, fall of 2022, we should have our new supplier up and running. It's not just as easy as turning on tomorrow. We need spe many specialized trucks that are quite unique to Muskoka uh, to be able to service uh, our areas. So, um, and then the other thing that we are really trying to do is look at our waste connect, our waste management strategy to reduce our landfills. I've mentioned that before. So that's my update. Good, thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards, you go right ahead, sir. Uh, 
Thank you very much. I'll be very brief because it's lunchtime. But uh, we had uh, an oral presentation from um, the Gravenhurst Against uh, Poverty. And um, they're planning a, a $1.2 million rental in the Ing building and that, and it will have 10 affordable housing units, two emergency shelter units, uh, a community hub, a community kitchen, and a young adult center. And that, and they'll also have three rental units in there as well. So uh, it's, it, it's really good news. And uh, social services, uh, we were awarded a grant of uh, $1,172,769. Dollars for social services and um, had a report on 10 year housing homelessness. Uh, the community initiative program, uh, pay it forward, got $40,000. Community enhancement got $62,208 for a total of $102,208 in uh, uh, grants. And everything else was other uh, in that municipalities. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report. Councilor Nishikawa, go ahead. If there, thank you. There you go. Um, I'll just quickly update uh, our meeting of July twenty second for the health unit. Um, so I'm trying to put things in the right order. Um, there was a request uh, to the province for increased funding for Andy's house. Um, that's moving forward. The um, an interesting financial update um, on from the OPP uh, and also insurance. And I, I just recommend that everyone uh, really look at our district council meeting minutes. There were some very interesting things passed uh, this last uh, month or two. And f f one particular one, Councillor Harding, if you can stop me if I go too far. Um, there was a request from the health unit. Sorry, can you hear the hammering going on? <laughs> Sorry. Very <Pretty> much. Um, <laughs> Tim, take a break. Sorry. Should, should we um, not hear the hammer? <laughs> uh, there, there's a request from the health unit. Uh, this is a very uh, substantial amount of money that was being requested from the district for $4.4 million. Um, the, uh, in fact, it, it, it wasn't, it was to, um, as I say, for, from Simcoe Muskoka Health Unit, that in fact, they have a shortfall in their funding um, from the province and they were looking for assistance from the district. There's a little more details about that, but I think if everyone watched the meeting, they would get a, a real good flavor of what the discussion was about. Also, uh, there is a transition happening uh, at Fairburn. So, um, there was a request for additional funds to go to uh, a situation that was happening in the temporary location for Fairburn residents. Um, we questioned that request because of the overall larger funding package. Uh, and there will be some very interesting updates on that package. I will say, though, that the, the dollars that we're talking about are... Um, Substantial and and substantial to to um, to healthcare in Muskoka Lakes and and the pushback to the province of what is the responsibility of the municipality and uh, for for us going forward is a very very important thing that we should be following. But in case so, some of you may recall that Fairburn uh, has been approved for 162 beds, if I if I remember correctly. Um, and also some questioning about the funding is, is, is to be looked at as well as the partnership with Fairburn. Uh, currently the town, the district does not, um, own Fairburn. So I would mostly set stress to everyone because we're talking again about millions and millions and millions of dollars. And I think, uh, rest of council should really watch that particular district council meeting, the, the past one that we had on Monday. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Mayor, did you go too far? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, item 11. So, oh, sorry. There are community events update. If there are any, please uh, 
Someone's got Barb, Councillor Bridgman, go ahead. Sorry, um, well, I want to bring up new business. Do you want me to wait? Uh, no, go right ahead. Okay, so just, just briefly, uh, Chair Zavitz, I've had a lot of inquiries about the gypsy moths, and I did Google it. They haven't come up for an, with the real alternative name yet, so I didn't know what to call it besides that. Um, but my, I, I am, um, I guess, seeking maybe that, that our council would ask the district, because it's a district-wide issue, could we somehow uh, send along a message to them to ask them for a strategy? I mean, I'm not sure spraying is the answer. There's some downsides to that. I don't have the answers, but I think it's up to district to be responding and let us know so that we can let our, our constituents know if district's going to take a position on it or whatever. So I'm not quite sure how to how to put that forward, if somebody yeah, could well, help. Well, thank me. you. And and to that point, uh, I was also referred to bring it forward to this committee. So I think a bunch of us have been inundated with that. I'm going to let the uh, CAO chime in here because I think you might have a good comment. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Certainly I'll try. So uh, as Councillor Bridgman said, uh, it strikes me that um, this is a matter that certainly Watershed Council has uh, has a position um, or, or provided information on. It tends to be uh, individual approaches, uh, property owner approaches versus a, a broader uh, fix, if you will. Um, it speaks to the cyclical nature of this uh, insect. And so uh, it, it may very well be that uh, Watershed Council, uh, a re request should go to Watershed Council with respect to um, giving further consideration and perhaps consultation with the province as to um, potential approaches going forward. Thank you. Follow up, Councillor Zavitz. Uh, the questions being asked of me is who's gonna pay for it? Like is, is the district going to do something and the individual owners don't have to foot the bill if they want to do something. So I think I need to know a response on that part too. Uh Thank you. And to that point, I think what I heard too was that uh, the, the questions have to be first posed and then <laughs> answers pondered. So um, I'm not sure how we as a township, and certainly pre uh, Councillor Mazan, but we as a township could formally create a resolution and then ask for support elsewhere. But uh, we'll, we'll be talking actually about that in a minute under general information and correspondence as it relates to. Um, other uh, communities in this Ontario province, all 444 of them and how they communicate uh, and how we re reinforce some of that information. So Councillor Mizan, go ahead. Uh, thank you and through you. Um, and, I did, and Barb did, um, sorry, Councillor Bridgman did freeze here. Uh, so I'm just going to pick up what I think uh, the request is and that is to ask the district to um, to help uh, create a strategy as it relates to these gypsy moths and uh, to start that process. And I just wanna make sure I'm clear because there is a distinction to be made between the Watershed Council and its role and then the district and its role. And I think one would, the Watershed Council might be able to provide and have actually for the past year been providing um, educational support but I think the request is more about from a, um, a Muskoka wide approach. This is maybe better in the hands of the district. So uh, I think the request is really more about a strategy. And I think I've been having the odd question about is spraying an option? And uh, I certainly would not be an expert on that. And I can see that others might be nodding their heads yes or no on that. And I don't think we're the body to do that. So I think this needs to be in the hands of the district as to an approach. Sure, here the chair, uh, sorry, the CAO would like to chime in again, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, not to put Councillor Edwards on the spot, but uh, he is our rep on the district's planning committee as well as Watershed Council. And perhaps that's something that he can uh, approach uh, either body with uh, if he's comfortable without the need for a resolution. Councillor Edwards? Uh, yes, I can do that in that asking uh, in that. Uh, 
this is province wide, not just uh, district wide. So it makes it uh, very, very difficult because if they start spraying, then they're going to start having birds dying and everything else like that. So it's it's not a simple fix. But anyway, we'll see what we can do. But uh, while I have the floor uh, on new uh, business, um, general information correspondence that we have. Uh, I believe to make things faster, if we see a letter that we would like to, to uh, bring up and we get it second, that we could move it to the next council meeting. Uh, and that like, uh, I'd like to bring it forward with all strains of, uh, of uh, testing for uh, Lyme disease being uh, paid for. If we had a seconder, we could move it rather than sending an email in and then trying to get a seconder and everything else like that. Uh, we're, we're trying to modernize. So I, I would like to, to see that happen. Okay, so we've well, thank you. So to your, I guess one bite at a time. So to your first comment, you'll uh, you'll do our bidding at the, the folks here at the yeah. at the district. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, second point, then, as it relates to item eleven, um, under general information and correspondence, and uh, you have been a champion of of uh, breaking this out and continuing to pay extra attention to these items as opposed to it in the aggregate, the way we used to get it. So. I, so are you suggesting, sir, that you would want us to actually go through every one and, uh, and or just highlight ones that councillors have found a seconder on? Go ahead. Well, what I would like to do is if somebody has one on, uh, like I said, on the, uh, the uh, expanded testing of uh, Lyme disease and that if we had somebody counsel that, uh, you don't have to go through every one. Another council may have something on on something else, but rather than yep. sending a, a, a an actual request in and that, it is on our business agenda here, and we should be able to look after it to speed things up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, and and I appreciate um, that concept. Uh, you know, we we used to get. Uh, the emails daily from different people. You may get ten of them over ten days on the exact same topic. Uh, I like what our clerk's department has done right now in grouping them together from a resolution perspective. Um, I guess anything that is really sensitive and urgent in nature, uh, you know, we do at times bring to directly to council. We'll notice this afternoon in our meeting that we do have a couple notice of motion that would have appeared a month ago, and then they are coming directly to council. So, I mean, we're, we're in a 30 day process window right now in the method. Um, I, personally, I, I like a contemplated email goes in, it's put on an agenda, as opposed to we see something today and it's trying to get put on an agenda this afternoon. Um, I think council does need some consideration to understand what it is we are going to be voting on and supporting. So, um, uh, you know, there's also the staff to provide time frame and paperwork. Uh, we need that to manage as well. So I'll leave it at that right now, Mike. Yeah, thank you. So. Go ahead. I, yes. wasn't, I wasn't talking about moving it on to today's agenda, just moving it so it would come on next month's agenda uh, and that, Mayor Harding. That it's a simple thing. And then if, if there's people, because it, it, you don't have to put staff through everything. If, if there's not a, a, a consensus for anything, then it doesn't go on. It saves staff time. But it would it wouldn't be on this afternoon. It would be on next month. Thank Can you. That? Sure. Okay. Well, so here here we'll try this. Um, so on today's agenda, on item eleven, there are uh, you know A through I um, various and sundry uh, matters of of import. Um, I guess I would ask a committee now and then. I, I now here and now I, we could actually go through and go down. If um, Councillor Edwards has identified B, uh, if there is a seconder of B, well, that's going starting at A, um, you know, and again, this is how we would have to do it is go through it one, one at a time. Councillor Hayes has her hand up. Is that? Uh, that was to second B, but I, I don't think that um, Councillor Edwards was requesting that each one of them be read out. I think he said that if someone could speak out if they were interested in one and see if there's a seconder. And since there's only been one come up about the Lyme disease and I will second it, then 
Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. All I wanted to do is create the same amount of presence for each one of these items. So given that, that all, all of the committee has looked at uh, A through I, and only uh, B has been identified and isolated as, a, as an interest piece, uh, Councillors uh, Edwards and Hayes first uh, moved it and then seconded it. Uh, nothing else? Oh, okay. Okay. So that, that, that works. Good new piece of business there. Thank you. Perfect. That is the word I just heard. Okay. Um, there is no closed session. It's uh, essentially uh, 1244. Uh, moved by, uh, sorry, no other, nothing else. Sorry, the mayor has his hand up. Thank you. Uh, just at the end of this meeting, I'm also going to recommend we do not start council at 1 p.m. I'm going to recommend that we at least wait 45 minutes, uh, depending what time, if we finish the next few minutes. If 45 is enough, otherwise maybe an hour just to give people a brief break and give staff a brief break and we'll try and uh, make up a little time. So why don't we say 1.45 if that's okay for everybody to give a full hour between. Good. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll call council at uh, one forty five this afternoon. We'll see you all then. Moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Mayor Harding. Be resolved that this meeting adjourn at uh, twelve forty five p.m. And the next regular meeting of the General Finance Committee will be held on Wednesday, September fifteenth, twenty twenty one, at nine a.m. or at the call of the chair, electronically from the council chambers, municipal office in Port Carling, Ontario. All those in favor. Good, thank you, we'll see you in an hour.